Everybody, please stand by. Well, wonderful. We are live. And hello and welcome to the Downtown Los Angeles Neighborhood Council 2021 Virtual Candidate Forum. My name is Marcus Loving, the Vice President of Outreach, and I'll be your moderator tonight. Before we begin, I'd like to lay out some ground rules for the event. But first, I'd like to remind everyone watching that this year's Neighborhood Council elections are being conducted by the Los Angeles City Clerk and vote by mail. You can get your ballot mailed to you by requesting your ballot by March 16th. Election day is March 23rd, which means you must mail in your ballot or have it postmarked by March 23rd and received by the city clerk no later than March 26th. Our official Dropbox, lo Dropbox location will be the Los Angeles Library for those unable to mail their ballots in as well as a ballot pickup location at the Weingarter Center, specifically for our unhoused stakeholders. Remember, even if you're registered to vote, you still have to request a ballot online. It will not automatically uh, be sent to you. You can find the links to request your ballot and all other election resources by visiting our new and improved D-Link website at dlink.com slash elections. Now back to the forum. Today's rules are very simple. We'll begin the program with every candidate providing a one minute introduction in alphabetical order by last name. Each candidate will then be given one minute to answer each of the curated questions submitted ahead of time from the audience in the order that they were re received for one hour. I have been the only person who has had access to any of these questions and to my knowledge, no candidate has seen them or have been offered them ahead of time. We will then spend the final 30 minutes on questions from the audience with 30 second answers from candidates and then a final one minute closing statement from each candidate in reverse alphabetical order. My wonderful alternate um, and assistant Ashley McCormick will be our timekeeper tonight. In order to keep things orderly, we ask that only one person speak at a time and only speak unless called upon by myself. Candidates should mute themselves when they are not speaking, after they are speaking, and only until they are called upon to speak. And please always remember to unmute yourself before speaking so that we can hear you. <laughs> and lastly, have fun tonight. So we will go ahead and jump into things. We are gonna start tonight with a one minute introduction from each of our candidates in alphabetical order, according to their last names, starting with Ryan Alfari. Okay, Ryan, one minute on the clock, Ashley, go right ahead. Please unmute yourself. Hi everyone, uh, welcome fellow candidates and voters. Uh, my name is Ryan Alfari, I'm your current Fashion District Business Director. I'm also the chair of the Planning and Land Use Committee for D-Lang currently. Uh, by background, I've grown up in LA my whole life. I started working on projects in LA uh, in the early 2000s. I was involved in everything from initial revitalization efforts, things like the adaptive reuse ordinance, which allowed the first uh, residential units to be built in downtown LA proper since you know many, many years ago, uh, conversion of old buildings. Uh, we've created many uh, you know, mixed use housing opportunities, uh, me and the company that I work with, um, and we've been long invested in downtown. In the last few years that I've been involved, I've been on D-Link for about four years at this point. Um, we've really focused on, or I've really focused on uh, helping streamline the process so that we can get as much housing built as possible. As many of you know, it's been kind of the, you know, looming And that's one minute. That's, that's one minute. Thank you so much, uh, Ryan. Goes fast. Yes, I know, it goes by very fast. Thank you so much. Um, our next is going to be Ms. Pat Barrett. Hello, everyone. First of all, Marcus, thank you for doing this. I really appreciate it. And thank you to all the candidates. I'm an active member of the community for over 10 years. I've been on D-Lang for three years and I, um, I'm an active member of the community. 
And then one of the first things I want to say is South Park Bid is a great resource, and I welcome all of you to come. And I've been and I have been on the um, livability committee, which I have spearheaded city park, I mean parks, doggy parks for the with the residents of Ass. I champion doggy waste stations, putting screens on drains and sewers throughout South Park, which prevents rats. And recycling, participating in D-Link initiative, feeding LA Fire Department during COVID and working on safety. I have learned what it takes to get the job done. I seek your support and reelection so I may continue to do the same. And what I say is what I do and I walk the walk. Thank you very much. Thank you talk so much. The talk. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Pat Barrett. Uh, next will be Ms. Patty Berman. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you for getting all of this together. My name is Patty Berman. I have lived downtown in the historic core for 21 years now. I have not aged a day. And um, I love downtown. I have been involved in the neighborhood council now for 17 years. Several of these uh, terms have been as the president of the council. We've gotten a lot accomplished, but there is so much more to do. And one of the things that I feel right now, I was isolated because of my age during the pandemic until I got vaccinated. And I've just recently in the last couple of weeks been able to go out and it just breaks my heart to see all these small businesses that have have had to close. Each one of those businesses is a family that no longer has an income. We need to work on that. And that is, I think, the most important thing we have to do right now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Patty Berman. Candidate is Melinda Truthessa. I'm sorry if I, uh, I'm there. Uh, Maylinda. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Can you see me? Hello. Hi, I'm Melinda Chitesa. Sorry, it's okay. It's a, it's a tough one. Um, my family is Thai, hence the difficult last name. And my mother came to the U.S. Uh, when she was in her late teens, early 20s. Had my brother and me young. Uh, single mom, immigrant story, struggled with mental illness. And uh, that leads me to downtown Los Angeles. So in a nutshell, I've been in downtown LA in some form or another since 2008, either living or working, the bulk of it at this point now living and having my own small business here in the fashion district and uh, doing neighborhood outreach, doing direct outreach with the homeless in the community and also being very interested in mental health care because my mother is severely mentally ill, was homeless. I've been on my own since I was 15 and here I am. Thank you. I believe I am frozen, but if you guys can hear me, the next person is Kevin. Hi, everyone. My name is Kevin Dieterly, and I'm running for D-Link as a historic core resident. I've lived here for nearly seven years. Um, I'm running because I believe that D-Link should elevate the issues most important to our community to the city council. And instead, D-Link often chooses to engage in undemocratic tactics that exclude community members from their local government, exemplified by this very forum, the time, date, and format of which was decided without consultation of any of the candidates on my slate, and in which non-incumbent candidates were invited to participate less than 24 hours ago. We should be trying to engage <clears throat> more people in local government, not fewer. And if elected, I pledge to work to make D-Link more accessible and to proactively engage the community uh, in D-Link's deliberations. Transparency is a requirement of good governance. Good governance is imperative for a healthy democracy and a healthy democracy cannot exclude the public as D-Link often does. If you want a more transparent, more inclusive and more accessible government that will demand accountability from our corrupt city council, I'll hope it, that you'll visit a better DTLA.com and learn more about my site's campaign and the many issues about which we are Thank passionate. Thank you so much, Kevin. That's been it. Next is Pablo Fontura. Hi, Marcus. Hello, everyone. My name is Pablo Fontura and I'm running to represent all resident stakeholders of the historic core on the D-Link board. I'll keep this plain and simple. For years now, the D-Link board has said that it serves the whole, with the sole purpose of being my voice, your voice, our voice. This is laughable. While we were protesting in the streets, D-Link was silent. When our city councilman was getting his house raided by the FBI and being stripped of his committee powers, D-Link was silent. When our most vulnerable communities were being ravaged by COVID because of a racist system that allows for it to happen, D-Link was silent. 
I will not be silent, we will not be silent. Neighbors, let us not forget, LA is a deep Dodger blue city. We believe in progressive policies like universal health care and living wages. We believe in police reform and government accountability. We believe in unions and a clean environment. For too long, we've had a dealing board that lives in a bubble and keeps its platform hidden from those it pretends to serve. The that time is over. Give me a chance, give our progressive slate a chance, and let's make change happen now. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't have you are guys are right here. I didn't see Peter Kuhn on this list. Peter, you are next. Hi, great, thank you. Uh, my name is Peter Kloon. I'm running for an area-wide seat. Um, and I believe this election is really a question of priorities, right? So how do we prioritize the limited amount of volunteer time and spend the small budget that our local neighborhood council has? I think that myself uh, and the other candidates on the Better Downtown Slate have a very clear and also a very different set of priorities than how D-Lank is currently run. Um, you know, I know I'm running because I think there is enormous potential uh, for D-Lank to educate and encourage people to engage in our community um, with our local politics, both within D-Lank and outside of it. You know, I've seen people get really discouraged or put off uh, when they do try and engage with the neighborhood council. And that's something that I really want to work to fix. Uh, I think, you know, fundamentally, that means a significant change in our neighborhood council towards prioritizing openness, accessibility, and transparency. Because the purpose and also the power of any neighborhood council completely come from community involvement. I think if we make sure to prioritize that and make it easy for people to be involved, it'll have a beneficial effect on every issue that DLANC works Thank on. You. Thank um, you so, so for more info, I encourage you all to check out our website at gtla.com. Oh, thank thanks. you so much. I appreciate that. And so sorry for, for a skipping over you there, Peter. I, I've, I've got you in the list now in alphabetical order. Next is uh, Kate Gallagher. Hi, my name is Kate Gallagher, and I'm running for the business seat in the fashion district. I'm a writer who works for a media company downtown, and I decided to run because I think the neighborhood council could be doing more. D-Link is a pretty influential body, and I believe that that power should be used to empower everyone in the community, not just the business owners or property owners, but also employees, tenants, of course, the thousands of unhoused people who call DTLA home. And if I'm elected, then I'm going to do everything I can to give a voice to the community members who are most affected by all of the issues that go on in DTLA. Um, that means meetings need to be more accessible. There needs to be more transparency and more public engagement. And we really all need to be working together to build a downtown that is better for everyone. Thanks. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I do not see Naira here. Uh, we will make sure that she's available to, she's able to join us if she's able to. We're gonna move on to Tony Hoover. Thank you, Marcus. <clears throat> Um, my name is Tony Hoover. I'm a downtown business owner and stakeholder for the last 20 plus years. Um, I currently serve as the area-wide business <sighs> seat, uh, director, and I'm also treasurer uh, for the Downtown Neighborhood Council. Prior to DLANC, I served for three years on the board of directors of a major homeless outreach organization in Hollywood. And one of the reasons why I joined DLANC originally was to, I wanted to look at the homeless uh, situation, not just from the uh, perspective of uh, an organization that serves the homeless directly, but also from a policy side, from the city side. Um, so that was one of my major goals was to learn from that. Um, uh, we are the voice uh, of an entire community of residents, business owners, property owners, workers, and other kinds of stakeholders, 300,000 persons in downtown. Um, and what I've always done is tried to listen to the concerns of all of those people, not just one segment, but the entire population, the 300,000. We, have our, we all have common interests that we need and goals that we need to meet uh, as, as, count, as board members. So that was pretty much the goal. Thank you so much, Tony. Brian is not here. Um, if Brian Kuth does join us, we will make sure to bring him in. Uh, we will go on to Joan McCraw. And John, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Hi. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I have lived and worked in a historic downtown for 15 years. Uh, I love downtown uh, and the classic architecture and the vibrant culture and the creative energy and spirit that fuels the downtown community. 
I've served on Zealand's outreach committee since November of 2020. And from 2004 to 2013, I worked in concert with uh, 213 Hospitality, helping to establish a thriving nightlife entertainment district in the bones of LA's uh, long neglected classic architecture. I served on the downtown center bid board on behalf of the media and 213 Hospitality and the historic downtown LA bid board representing 213 from 2009 to 2011. Uh, I'm seeking a historic core residency uh, and I would love to enlist and engage more participation in reviving uh, downtown LA as we come out of this. Thank you uh, so much, Joan. That's one oh. minute. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. If you can please mute yourself. Thank you. Our next speaker and candidate will be Rick Nordine. Thank you, Marcus. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Rick Nordine. Uh, I have lived downtown for eight years. My professional background is a uh, nonprofit fundraiser, so I work with volunteer organizations extensively. I serve on a couple of other boards currently, uh, one helping mentally challenged and uh, troubled families and youth. Uh, there are three words that come to mind when I think of the work of D-Link. One is service, like listening to the neighbor who's complaining about how dirty the Metro Center is right now. Two, uh, listening to uh, the people who are next to a development where the, the contractor or the developer hasn't listened to them. And, and thirdly, and most important, I think it's collaboration. We don't do anything alone. This is a group of volunteers without any staff. We have to collaborate with other people, be they elected officials or other nonprofits to make things better in LA. If we don't do that, uh, we're wasting our time here. Thank you, I appreciate your support. I'm in the financial Thank district you, of Bunker Hill. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rick. Our next candidate is Cody Nowak. You're going to count me off of the uh, timer there? Thank you. Hi, my name is Cody Nowak. Uh, I've worked in the and in, in consult in the AEC industry, architecture, engineering, construction, for over a decade here in the downtown area, building many of the large buildings, working on many of the large projects. So I understand what it takes uh, from uh, coming from the, the builder side and the owner side uh, in being a part of the city. So uh, I've actually lived down here for two years as well. And uh, what I'd like to do, uh, being on the South Park Business uh, D-Link board, is uh, help build, rebuild, and recover uh, post-COVID. Uh, we've seen, we've all seen all these small businesses, mom and pops, uh, go out of business if they're suffering. Um, and what I believe is, uh, we as a board um, that are unpaid individuals should come together and collaborate and cooperate uh, and hear each other and learn from each other and work together to build a better downtown LA. Thank you, Cody. Our next candidate is Claudia Oliveira. Hi, everybody. I'm Claudia Oliveira. I've served on the link for two terms now, and I had the pleasure to be able to um, exercise my goal, which is break through barriers and uh, address all um, stereotype threats that keep people from achieving their goals. Whether that is our unhoused population, we've done job fairs in uh, Skid Row, where we got 100 people jobs and where we do expungements to be able to allow them to have achieved their goals. But my same passion that I have for our house population, I also have for our small businesses. And with that, I created the Small Business Symposium where I help people learn how to become vendors with the city and microloans and all that. I think that both, both sides of the link have to come together. So all of our constituents from the house population, the small business owners, and the residents, and everybody. And that is my goal. Thank you so Thank much, you. Claudia. Our next candidate is Nisha Parekh. Please excuse if I uh, butchered your last name, Nisha. Actually, you pronounced it perfectly. Thanks, Marcus. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Nisha Parekh. I am running for business representative seat for the Financial District Civic Center, and I'm part of the Better Downtown Progressive Slate. 
I currently work for a federal agency located on Figueroa and prosecute employers who fail to pay workers minimum wage and overtime and fail to keep workplaces safe. Uh, my family moved to LA in 1992 to escape apartheid in South Africa, but ironically, that was the same year as the Rodney King riots. Uh, racial injustice and unequal access to resources, including safe workspaces, have thus always been issues that have shaped my life. Um, I have spent time downtown since 2001 when I went to prom at the Omni Hotel. I went to USC. Um, I have spent time, I grew up, you know, in the underground art scene in downtown LA and have very much seen um, the development that's taken place, um, both for the good and the bad, um, including how it's left people out. And I'm running to, like my slate, build an inclusive downtown LA. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nisha. Is Austin here? Austin Kreifogel. I don't believe. She couldn't I... make it tonight. Okay, thank you, Nisha. Um, if for some reason Austin can join us later, I will make sure to add Austin to the list. Next up is Jihan Reagan. Hi, thanks for having me. I uh, just wanted to introduce myself. It's um, Jehan Reagan. It was close, but just a little bit off. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> it's common. Um, I have a background in nursing. Um, I mentioned that because, as you know, um, as nurses were the most trusted profession, um, my background includes ER nursing. I often dabble in substance abuse treatment. I have a history in hospice, and I currently provide needed care to veterans providing um, medical care. Um, that they usually waited three years for. Um, I mentioned that because as you know, all those things are sometimes difficult to manage. Um, I usually uh, migrate towards the difficult uh, situations. I like the challenge. And um, when I moved downtown about two years ago, I noticed that there were challenges. I noticed um, downtown improving, but there's definitely were challenges. And as I've seen through COVID that there's been some um, steps back. Um, so my goal um, is just to um, get involved, to be proactive and to help Thank represent you, all individuals. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Welcome. Our next candidate is Jim Sartori. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jim Saratori, and I'm an architect. I live uh, near downtown, but I work in South Park, which is the business chair I'm running for. I've been working in downtown for over 10 years now. I have a big passion for cities and creating sustainable, livable environments, big into adaptive reuse projects. And I think housing is our big defining issue of our generation. I think we have a lot to deal with, obviously, with homelessness and creating affordable housing, permanent support of housing, um, everything that's a huge priority for me. I'm also a big nerd when it comes to public transportation and city planning, creating green space around our city. Um, I've also spent the last uh, seven, eight years working and running nonprofits, uh, one of which was called Open Architecture Collaborative. We provide free design services to those in need. And now I'm helping uh, on the board of Broadway West, which is trying to revitalize the historic theaters on Broadway. Thank you so much, Jim. Our next candidate is Sean Smith. Hey there, everyone. Um, my name is Sean Smith. I am a downtown resident since 1990. Um, I serve on the D-Link board. I've worked on the livability and outreach committees. And um, I've also worked on uh, Watch DTLA, iHeart DTLA, and HelpingPlaces.org. Um, I believe in uh, giving, I believe in being of service to my community. And, um, you know, we have a slate, DTLA2021.com. It's a group of nonpartisan candidates that don't have a political agenda. They're not regressive. They are downtowners first and above all else. So some agenda will never be above that. Um, and so we have a really amazing diverse group of candidates that are LGBT, of color, just uh, the smartest, most amazing people that are of service to their community. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Our next candidate is Jacob Van Horn. Hey everyone, uh, thank you for putting this on. I don't actually want to talk a lot about myself because I think I'm pretty unimportant to the whole process. What I'd like to tell you is what I would hope to do if I'm fortunate enough 
to be elected as a historic core resident representative. What I think is most important that we do is outreach, bringing to the community and as many stakeholders as possible, in my case, the residents that live in the historic core, what we're working on and what we're discussing but equally as important as once we outreach is listening. And that's what I pledge to do. I don't want to represent my own views, a party's views, a slate's views, anything along that line. I want to represent your views if you're elected. I'm more than willing to cast a vote that may not be what I particularly agree with, but if it's what the community says that they want and desire, that's what I want to do. I want to be your voice and I hope to have your vote. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jacob. Next candidate is Kevin Barzander. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin. My pronouns are he, him. I've been a resident of Los Angeles since 2016. And some of my earliest memories of downtown are going to Laker games with my dad, that first season that Staples Center had opened. Um, and I remember just thinking, I'd love to live here someday. And here I am. Um, and although the world around us seems pretty grim these days, we each have an ability to make it a little bit better. I have a background in environmental planning, but these days I do spend a lot of my time doing homelessness outreach as a member of Street Watch and also in my private capacity. Uh, I'm someone who's strongly oriented towards justice, equity, and to use my privilege to uplift the most marginalized folks in our communities. These are tenants, people of color, workers, and the unhoused. And as a member of DLINC, I would bring this lens to everything I do. Those are my politics, and I do think it's important to have a political agenda if you're running for office. Neighborhood councils do have potential because they're composed of ordinary people applying their moral compass to guide the actual politicians. And DLINC has not used this bully pulpit to its fullest potential. So we're running on a better downtown slate to change that. Thank you. Uh, so Thanks. Thank you so much. And last is Debbie, Debbie Zhu. Hi, my name is Debbie Zhu. Um, I lived in downtown for five years. I'm running for the South Park residency. seat. Um, actually work in analytics for a tech company on the west side. So I actually just love it in downtown so much that I deal with that commute well up until last year now we're from home. Um, but basically I believe that Angelinas deserve a walkable city that we can all live in for our entire life and not just place that we move to and then um, when we wanna start families, we move away to the suburbs. And so since I moved here five years ago, my focus has been on livability. Um, it drove me to become a board member for DTLA Strong. I felt compelled to what to do what I could in my personal capacity to improve my neighborhood. And from this experience, I learned that this goes beyond just like voting every couple of years or calling and emailing City Hall. Um, that's why I decided to run for D-Link this year um, to advocate for my neighbors and friends through a city designated organization. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. So sorry about butchering your last name. It's okay. It's normal. <laughs> Thank you very much. That concludes our first portion of introductions for our forum tonight. Just a reminder for everyone watching, we are going to have 30 minutes of questions from our audience at home. So please put those questions in the comments if you're watching on Facebook. We will get to that after our next hour of pre-submitted um, uh, questions, which we are going to be moving on to right now. So our first question is going to be from Tom from Skid Row. Do you support Skid Row getting its own neighborhood council? And if yes, how do you see yourself playing a role in helping that come about? And we will go back up to the top, starting with Mr. Ryan Afari. One minute. Thank you, Marcus. And thank you to the uh, constituent who asked the question. My work in downtown has always been towards a policy of decentralization. I do not believe in the ghettoization of any area downtown, within downtown, within LA. I think we need to have our unhoused and housed people living together. And I think that our policy decisions should also be made together. I do think that homeless people uh, or people, uh, the unhoused population deserves to have a seat at the table. It's why we make an effort um, currently on D-Link to make sure that we have those voices, we have representatives, we have seats that are particularly reserved for people who are uh, you know, home, homeless outreach advocates and people who work with that community as well. Um, so I, I do not believe in, uh, you know, creating a separate uh, neighborhood council just for the unhoused population or for Skid Row. I do believe, though, that in our time, we've approved permanent supportive housing and we've supported the organizations that, um, you know, act as support for this community. Thank you so much, Ryan. Pat Barrett.
Thank you very much. Um, no, I am not in support of having um, Skid Row having their own neighborhood council, number one. Number two is I believe we all need to work together so we can learn from each other as a community. I truly believe that it, you know, when you work together, as LeBron James says, a team makes a dream. So why can't we work together and learn from the homeless and from us so that we can support and um, make an effort so that we can all sit at the table together and we can help each other to work together and become a better community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat Baer. Uh, Patty Berman. Well, I believe that we are stronger together than we are apart. And for that reason, I would like to see all of downtown under one neighborhood council. I do believe that we need more outreach in that area because we have a seat for homeless people. We find it very difficult to keep it filled. And I would love to have people on the board who could help us to make sure that that keeps happening. But I do believe that we are stronger together. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Berman. Uh, Melinda. Melinda. Sorry, sorry, Melinda. It's okay. You threw me earlier. It, it threw me off. Um, Ashley, Ashley, would you mind if we restart the clock for Melinda? <laughs> Give you a whole you, 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 you hijacked me earlier. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, Melinda. You caught me off guard. Okay. Hi. Um, again, my name is Melinda Chutesa, for anybody who missed it earlier. Um, I need to research a little bit better because my, my involvement directly in things that are related to neighborhood councils only started within the last year, year and a half. So I would need to research it a little bit better in order to give the appropriate response because I'm a very methodical person and I don't like to jump to any conclusions without doing my due diligence and doing my research. That being said, for me personally, as someone who is the daughter of someone who only recently got off the streets, I do think it is important to give people who have been through that experience or who are currently experiencing homelessness or houselessness, um, however you'd like to say it or look at it, it is important for them to have a voice and to be able to give input and for us to have some form of outreach to have them tell us what they need from us. But in terms of forming a separate neighborhood council, I do have to look into that further before I can answer correctly. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Peter Kuhn. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, I'd like to say absolutely yes. Um, I 100% would support the creation of the Skid Row Neighborhood Council. Um, and for anyone who's interested in more information, I deeply encourage you to look at the LA Weekly article um, that covers the last election for the Skid Row Neighborhood Council. Um, that election was, for all intents and purposes, a bit of a farce. Um, there was interference from the city. Uh, there was interference from members of the D-Link board. Um, there were complaints filed that the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, which oversees the neighborhood council system, um, had to adjudicate. Uh, there were serious problems with the way that it was conducted um, and a lot of inter interference, specifically um, coming from people involved with D-Link um, and other groups downtown to make sure that there was not the creation of the Skid Row Neighborhood Council. Um, you know, I don't want to directly speak for everybody, but if you're listening, I would encourage you to go, to go to the website for the Skid Row Neighborhood Council Formation Committee. Um, they make the case for what they want better than I ever could. Um, and I think it's really important, Thank like Patty so said Peter. earlier, there is homeless Thank here, so but it's been Peter. empty. You like isn't serving those interests so and the broader interests. Thank you so much. Our next candidate is Kevin. Thank you for the great question. Um, yes, I unequivocally support a Skid Row Neighborhood Council. Um, it's been interesting that so many mentioned working together with them as though being a member of D-Link precludes them from working with other neighborhood councils. Um, neighborhood councils should work together, but we also need to uplift the voices of our unhoused community, which is absolutely massive in downtown LA and um, has been concentrated in skin ro Skid Row due to deliberate policy choices. Um, and if we were really serious about uplifting the voices of our unhoused neighbors, we would have made it possible for them to participate in this meeting. We would have done outreach to make sure that they were included and could participate in some other venue other than having Facebook access. Um, so yes, I do support it. It's important that communities are able to advocate for themselves and we need to um, empower them to be able to do that, including on Skid Row. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Pablo. 
Uh, I'm going to agree with uh, Kevin and Peter on this. Absolutely, Skid Row needs its own neighborhood council. For too long, D-Link has neglected them. Uh, they need people to represent them um, more fairly and more fully. And we're going to do whatever we can to help them uh, do that. Um, we're not a voice for everyone right now. And we're definitely not a voice for Skid Row in its current form. So absolutely support that. Thank you, Pablo. Kate Gallagher. Yes, I am completely in support of a Skid Row Neighborhood Council because that's what the people of Skid Row seem to want. Um, they felt that they weren't being heard by D-Link and it's easy to see why based on some of the responses that have been given by current board members up to this question. Um, I think the people who live in Skid Row should be given the basic respect to determine their own fate through the democratic process. And as Peter said, the vote for the Skid Row Neighborhood Council was not conducted fairly or democratically. And if I'm elected to D-Link, then I will do whatever I can to use the council's influence to advocate for the formation of a Skid Row Neighborhood Council. And until then, I'll do whatever I can to advocate for the interest of our unhoused neighbors within D-Link. Thank you so much, Kate. Tony Hoover. Uh, again, my name is Tony Hoover. Um, I, I can't really answer that question with a yes or a no because I'd have to know more about exactly why uh, a separate council would want to be made for Skid Row. Um, I can tell you, though, that since I've been on the board, the majority of our discretionary budget has gone to Skid Row. Um, I know that because I'm the treasurer, so I see where the money goes and I also see where the requests come for the money. Um, in addition to that, uh, the vast majority of our volunteer time goes to Skid Row uh, needs. Uh, at least the people that on the board that I've been working with. So um, I, I'm not quite sure where people are getting the fact that we are not, that we're not uh, giving our time to Skid Row or our money because that's just simply not true. Um, and the other thing is um, every neighborhood has its own unique needs. Um, so does that mean every neighborhood in downtown should have its own neighborhood council? Um, Chinatown and so forth like that, you know, for example. Um, so uh, I think together we're, we're, we're better as a team. We work with the entire neighborhood to kind of concentrate Thank on, you, on the needs of, of Skid Row. Thank you so much. Next is Joan McCrum. Joan, make sure you unmute yourself. I'm not in favor of a separate organization for the unhoused. Uh, however, I am committed to working on behalf of Skid Row to bring more resources to bear. And one of the ways to do that is to connect with colleges and universities and pull in students who are, who are already specializing in social services to work with Wendell, who is actually running unopposed um, to, to mentor in a mentorship program uh, that will bring, you know, services to bear in Skid Row. Thank you so much, Jim. Rick Norden, Nordin. You know, my answer is a clear no. I talk about collaboration and I think of Franklin Roosevelt did not stand for the lesser in our country during the depression by separating them off. He put his arms around everybody. And that's what we need to do in downtown LA. We do not divide, we do not segment. We put our arms around everybody. And I've walked every neighborhood, including Skid Row. So I look at D-Lank as my whole neighborhood, not just the part I'm officially running for. That's what everybody has to do. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Uh, right. Cody. So uh, I, I'm new to neighborhood councils, uh, D-Lank as well, uh, you know, living here for two years now, uh, working for over 10. Uh, I don't have too much experience in Skid Row besides driving through. Um, so I'll be the first to admit that I'm not educated enough to, uh, on the subject to actually uh, answer um, yes or no. So uh, I'm willing to educate myself more uh, if it is a, a, a big subject that uh, the neighborhoods would like, especially Skid Row would like to uh, investigate further. So um, I, I'm willing to go out on my own and, and look for more information about this. And if there's anybody out there that has more information and would like to share with me, uh, please go ahead and share my, my Facebook page here. Thank you. Thank you, Cody. Claudia. 
Hi, so I think uh, I'm very, I'm always in Skid Row all the time. Um, I help produce the Skid Row job fair and uh, it saddens me to hear that um, every time somebody says that we do nothing for Skid Row because having 400 people show up and in our second, they were coming with, with uh, resumes. You know, we got, we got our job fair um, registered with the county and we're getting people with caseworkers. We did hygiene key, kits multiple times. We supported the Skid Row uh, Festival for all artists every year, almost, not a, almost, almost every year. We did, we just recently did uh, 3,300 uh, 3, masks uh, to Skid Row. And we do the maps of wayfinding maps so people can know where to wash their clothes. 7,000 of those. And not just that, but so much more. These are all that I can fit in a minute, but feel free to reach out. I'll be more than Thank glad to talk Claudia. about what we do. Thank you, Claudia. Misha. Thank you. Um, so I will never forget uh, standing on spring and seventh, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, and a Skid Row resident saying to me, this is Skid Row. Um, and it was a reminder to me that before downtown was developed, Skid Row went all the way to what, Olive Broadway. And when downtown developed, the developers used the police to push the unhoused community across Los Angeles and used police to police those people and keep them there. Um, so I strongly support a neighborhood council for Skid Row residents, for folks to stand up and protect themselves and have a voice before City Hall and have a separate voice from D-Link and the developer voice. And I also wanna challenge those who've been on, served on D-Link for many, many years or said that they helped develop downtown LA because you haven't included the unhoused community and that's clear. Um, and that's why I'm running and that's why my slate is running. Check out our platform, abetterdtla.com. Thank you, Misha. Jehan. Uh, my initial response would be no. However, it'd be hard to make that my final decision without actually speaking to the individuals um, in Skid Row. Um, ideally, um, I'd like to assess the barriers to uh, making sure, or I guess just making sure that everyone feels included, um, because the goal would be to unite as one in a D-Link rather than separate, because often when things remain separate, then there's inequalities, and we already know that that exists in Skid Row. So the, the goal would be unite to support and to help it better. Thank you. Jim. Thanks. Um, I'd certainly like to learn more about it. I don't know enough about why one would be needed. Um, I, I certainly want to make sure that everyone has a voice and everyone's voice is heard. Um, but I'd really like to learn more information about why it's needed and, and uh, what other things that DLANS hasn't done that we could do to uh, make sure that everyone has, is, has a voice at the table. Thank you. Sean. Hey there. Um, so Claudia, uh, myself, and another board member in our private capacities uh, brought 330,000 masks to Skid Row organizations. And um, me in my personal capacity has uh, worked on a project called Helping Places, a directory of services for those needing help, but also wanting to help. Um, as my first time coming to downtown LA was in 1981 to visit my dad at the Ford Hotel, a Skid Row Hotel. Um, my dad lived in Section 8 housing, and I will always keep Skid Row's needs and those that are dealing with mental illness, addiction, uh, inequality at the forefront. I mean, as a whole, I mean, we can help better. Well, we have seats that sit empty for quite a while. Um, and, and so we do need people involved and you, um, seats are there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Jacob. Hi. So here's what I think on this. Right now, the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment who runs the neighborhood council system has a process for this. When somebody wants to go and break off, they have a vote. And I'll be honest, right now, that's a flawed process because when Quebec had a secession vote, for example, in Canada. 
it's not all of Canada voting. When Puerto Rico votes for independence, it's not Puerto Rico in America. I think that process needs to be changed so that it is only the area which would be removed that those stakeholders vote. Now, if they decide they want to do that, and I think be as inclusive in both the vote and including bringing all of the stakeholders in the area to a table, then that is up to them and that's their destiny to decide. If I were elected to D-Link, I would be willing to advocate for that process, for that change to the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment to let that area decide and just let that area itself decide and chart its own destiny. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Kevin. Uh, my answer to this would be an unequivocal, unequivocal yes. Um, I do think Skid Row uh, should be allowed to uh, have its own neighborhood council. Um, and like Peter mentioned a while ago, I, I would encourage everybody who's been answering, oh, I don't know enough about this, please read the LA Weekly article about, uh, it's titled, Who Killed uh, Skid Row Neighborhood Council? It's from June 2017. So this was not very long ago, relatively, it was four years ago. And I do think if you're going to um, be seeking office in downtown, it's important to know at least the recent history of, uh, you know, the, the power plays and uh, who was responsible for killing the neighborhood council in Skid Row. Um, it's really important that they do have their own neighborhood council. That's 40 something thousand dollars, like over $40,000 uh, a neighborhood council can have to decide to spend as it chooses in its own community. And Skid Row has such unique needs. Um, you know, who are we as downtown neighborhood council to be like, oh, we know what's best for them. We're not even gonna do outreach to fill our homeless seat. We're not going, you know, we need to be able to have a Skid Row neighborhood council. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks. Thank you so much. Debbie. Um, so I would like to get input into why DLN has had such difficulty filling and keeping those uh, homeless seats filled. Um, I also want to know from Skid Row stakeholders what they're looking to achieve by forming their own neighborhood council and seeing where D-Link can, if possible, fill those gaps before I say yes or no. Um, you know, DLA 2021 slate, a better announced slate, we're trying to represent all the stakeholders of downtown. So we should all also include Skid Row representatives because um, that's what we're all shooting for, right? That's the goal of everyone that's running today. So that's that's my response. Thank you so much, Debbie. So we will go ahead and go on to our second question. This question is from Leon from the Historic Core. The question is, do you have a plan to help the homeless, including getting the mentally ill off the streets? And we're gonna go ahead and start with you again, Debbie. So homelessness is a very complicated issue that can't be solved overnight. And I don't think that d or any one entity in downtown can, can do it. I, we had this question asked to us also during DTLA strong meetings. Uh, I think it's a multifaceted thing. There's, there's, there's the issue of where, where we can actually move people into housing and how we can improve that process. We've seen from the Vignes housing project and then pallet housing that's launched in North Hollywood that we can do this quickly and cheaply which um, we've seen from previous uh, efforts that our, our former council member did that were not effective. So I think we should push for that. We should push for where we can find housing options and then how we can better work with other neighborhood councils because homelessness is obviously all across LA now to demand comprehensive solutions from our city and from our county because the county is responsible for mental health services. Thank you so much. Debbie, Kevin. Yeah, so uh, like Debbie said, homelessness is an incredibly complex issue. And, uh, but what I do think a neighborhood council uh, can do about this is, you know, it does fall within our purview to, to serve as a bully pulpit to the city council. And city council every few weeks is coming out with one policy or another that uh, criminalizes the unhoused, uh, that makes it harder for uh, them to get into housing, that uh, promotes sweeps. And these are also things that D-Link has uh, supported. Um, in January of 2020, uh, we saw a unanimous yes vote to block a 100% affordable housing zone in Skid Row. Uh, I believe during that same meeting, there was an ask to uh, enforce uh, LAMC 4118, which would uh, pro prohibit sit 
sitting, lying, and uh, standing on sidewalks, these measures of criminalization do not end homelessness. They, in fact, exacerbate them. What ends homelessness is putting people into homes, and we need to actually to, to fund uh, Thank putting you. them right now. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Jacob, Ben. So, no, I don't have a solution. I wish I did. Um, there are many people that are bringing solutions to the table. And I'll be perfectly honest, we're not going to solve homelessness from DEMA. Uh, what we can do is we can listen to those who are bringing these solutions to the table. The legislatures, as we have advisory powers. And it's going, as I mentioned before, talking, listening to concerns of all of our stakeholders, home, uh, unhoused and housed alike. It's listening to those solutions, getting their input on these strategies. So it's sorting through these and giving our neighborhood a voice on what we think the solution should be and what we think of the ideas coming forward to the table. And we can do that. Uh, I hope it has an effect and I hope we're going to start seeing an end of the solution to this problem. And I'd like to help in that aspect. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Sean. Hey there. Um, I think I just heard another candidate say that they want to use D-Link as a bully pulpit. Is that, I think that's what I heard. And um, I don't believe in weaponizing our neighborhood council. Um, so on re in, in regards to homelessness, um, I was homeless myself. And what I learned was that there's not enough beds. I don't think the solution is throwing $700,000 units at, at the issue. We need more beds. And who really holds the keys is the county supervisors. If you ask nine, if you ask 10 people, nine will say they know that, that they don't know what a county supervisor is, but they have so much power and influence over this issue because they oversee the Department of Mental Health. Thank you, Sean. Jim. So we're obviously not building enough housing in general. We also don't have enough temporary shelter for anybody. It's amazing to me that New York City houses 97% of their homeless and we're, we house somewhere between 20 or 25%. We need to be making it easier to build housing. We need to be making it easier to build temporary shelter all over the city. There's been so many proposals out there that I've seen that can't get approved. We don't, there's no reason to say that we don't have space for it in the city. Obviously there's so much, there's only so much we can do as part of D-Link but we need to, in general, be supportive of all kinds of ideas that come forward. And we, we need to be making it easier to get these projects built and stop putting up roadblocks to building anything. We need to build more affordable housing, but, we, but developers aren't gonna build something if they can't make any money. So we have to advocate for building as much affordable units in those um, newer buildings as we can. So. Thank you, thank you so much, Jim. Jehan. Well, I wish I had the solution to solving the homeless problem. I don't. Um, as we're speaking of that, I'm thinking of um, not just necessarily the homelessness that's going on now, but the future homeless that we also need to be concerned about. Um, just with COVID and people needing um, um, rent extensions or unable to pay their rent. Um, so. I'm also focused on how can we keep people in the current housing situation that they have, whether that's connecting them to the proper resources and also pinpointing what's causing the homelessness because like everyone agrees it sounds like is it's so dynamic and diverse why everyone's homeless where it's mental health, um, unable to maintain a job, various things. Um, the, the goal though I think would be um, to just utilize all resources, not be the expert and just work as I guess commutatively in hopes of solving that problem. But I do definitely don't think that's gonna be solved overnight, you know, unfortunately. Thank you, Jehan. Nisha. So it's funny because my, my initial reaction to this question was the last question, um, which is to give, uh, to build a neighborhood council, a skid row neighborhood council, so the homeless, you know, the unhoused community has a, a voice to, to speak up for itself. It's separate from DTLA, which has a lot of other, cons you know, cons constituents and kind of stuff going on. Um, I also, you know, there are um, so many ideas, there are so many studies, there are so many folks who've spoken up and said, this is what we need. 
if homelessness is still an issue in LA, it's not for lack of ideas, but it's a lack of political will. And I don't think that it's um, helpful to be, to serve as an elected official, even on an advisory body like D-Link that doesn't have legislative powers and say that, oh, somebody else, like the uh, supervisors or whoever else has the power, you're elected, the people voted you into office. And so D-Link has the responsibility to, to do something whether it's just elevating ideas and building partnerships across LA. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha. Claudia. Hi. Um, so um, this is something that I can say that I truly spent a lot of time on. Um, and I think that to solve the issue, you first have to know what it is, right? And everybody has this misconception, but there are so many other reasons why people become, uh, go, go through homelessness. Uh, one of it is reentry. The county has no plan on a person leaving a prison system or, or where are they going to live and how they're going to get a job and they make it so difficult. The other thing is transitional age youth. A lot of our foster, foster kids, when they turn 18, they become homeless. They cannot put their name in the list to, for housing before that. And the other one is domestic violence. All of these are people that really need our help but this is a county problem and we have to have push the county. And I think that it's, there's a lot more issues in the agencies, they don't communicate with each other. So the, there's a lot of solutions, but Thank there's you, no communication. Thank you, Claudia. Mm -hmm. Cody. Yeah, so uh, th there are a lot of solutions out there or, um, a lot of people claim they have solutions. Um, I, I do not definitely have this solution. Um, and as the neighborhood council comes together, I think that uh, we should be listening to um, people that are experiencing homelessness and uh, potentially, you know, that's, that's a start, you know? Um, and uh, again, we're an advisory council. You know, council so um, I, we're a good start, I think, to start advising some of the other um, uh, political parties that might be able to assist uh, and make better decisions on uh, future um, propositions or whatever it is to, to start s solving those issues. Um, but again, it's not going to happen overnight. Thank you, Cody. Rick. I have a guy named Jerry. That's that's my focus on homelessness. He lives on the streets down here. And I talk with him a couple times a week. Now it's only a data point of one, but I wonder how many of you actually talk with the homeless to, to listen to what's going on as opposed to, uh, to use a lack of a better word, pontificate on the problem. Here's what I propose for d to do uh, when we reform after the election, that we hold and we ask the, all the appropriate people for a, a summit on homelessness in downtown Los Angeles. And we have a former city council person and a, a former mayor candidate who is the chair of the uh, County Homeless Services Commission, Wendy Gruel. We, we line up the list of people and we, we put on a, a function to, to get some message out on this. There's also a new study out on how to language homelessness that we need to look at. That's Thank something so we much. can do. Thank you so much, Rick. Joan. Joan, please unmute yourself. Okay. As a dealing director, I am committed to supporting programs that benefit the unhoused. On a personal level, um, I am committed to uh, contributing hours and expertise on food banks and quality of life issues for the in-house. Thank you, Joan. Tony. Thank you, Marcus. Um, so uh, the first thing I want to say is um, I'm in agreement with Sean on one particular point, and that is we cannot weaponize the neighborhood council system. This is not a productive use of the neighborhood council system. We need to work together. That's what we need to do. Uh, we have 300,000 stakeholders in downtown. That's a powerful thing, 300,000 people. 
Um, and we could leverage that number of people to do a lot of really good things if we can get everyone together on this on this topic. Um, a lot more than than, a, than you know a Skid Row neighborhood council could do. Um, and with that said, also I, I've I've been on the board of a of a homeless organization, so I kind of have some understanding of the of the of the legal challenges as well as some of the other challenges that the organizations deal with. We are not going to solve this problem as a neighborhood council. Um, it's incredibly complex. Um, but uh, in terms of the reentry program that Claudia was talking about, it's totally broken. Uh, foster care system completely broken. Thank you, Tony. Thank you very much, Kate. Yeah, as some people have already said, um, the number one issue uh, regarding homelessness is just not having enough affordable housing. Um, and this is something that D-Link actually has a lot of power over. Um, they have a say in the development projects that are built in DTLA. Um, too many developments that are going up downtown are too expensive for even most regular workers to afford, never mind people who are currently unhoused. Um, the council can also advocate to the city council for housing policies. Um, for example, seizing the hotels to give temporary housing to unhoused people during the COVID pandemic. Um, they can also do outreach with um, community organizations like LA Can and Street Watch that are already doing hands-on work with the unhoused community downtown. Um, there's just a lot of things that can be done um, to help solve the homelessness crisis as much as a neighborhood council can do. And I think we need to stop playing dumb and actually do something to solve the problem. Thank you, Kate. Pablo. Just to kind of reiterate what my slate mates have been saying, first and foremost is engaging the community and engaging social service uh, workers, uh, people in the community that work closely with the homeless um, to give them a real, real voice that's been missing for so long. And if that means, like we said earlier, getting them their own counsel, let's do it. No one knows what they need more than themselves and the people that work closely with them and advocate, advocate for them, honestly, that's been missing. There's so many solutions that we can't do, but what we can do is be their voice. And that's what we'll do and, and, and we'll, we'll pledge to do. Thank you, Pablo. Kevin. Yeah, um, it's a great question. And I, you know, even the way it was framed is kind of interesting. It was about um, getting the mentally ill off the streets. I think that really is dehumanizing and we need to think about why people are unhoused to begin with, why people have mental, untreated mental illness to begin with, and what can we do to offer the you know, whole person supports that are needed to make people live you know, full and, and healthy lives. Um, Sean mentioned weaponizing the, uh, the neighborhood council. It is literally our job to be advocates for our community to the city council. And um, that is what we are brought here to do if elected. And we need to have a very honest conversation with the city council about how they're choosing to allocate their budget. They've always had the power during this pandemic to seize the hotels, to house our unhoused neighbors with full federal, uh, you know, recently full FEMA reimbursement. And Nuri Martinez, the council president, won't agendize it. Our budgets are a statement of priorities and our city council has not prioritized the unhoused. And so we need to change that. That's our job. Thank you, Kevin. Peter. Thank you, Marcus. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to take this question as a chance to sort of really focus on what would change versus what has happened previously within D-Link um, around issues sort of surrounding this, right? So specifically affordable housing, right? Many people enter homelessness through evictions, through being unable to pay their rent. Um, we as a city are probably facing a tsunami of evictions once tenant protections end, um, you know, as the COVID pandemic winds down. Um, and, but just in the last year, we've seen, um, you know, within this council, to vote against zoning for 100% affordable housing, um, voting to oppose a right of first refusal um, for the city um, when Ellis Act evictions happen, um, and voting to oppose anti-displacement zones around developments that have zero affordable housing. Um, these are all positions taken by DLANC within the last year, you know, directly in opposition to the development of further affordable housing within this city, um, and the sort of thing that would be a decided change, um, something that I think I can speak for myself and all the, my slate mates on the Better Downtown slate, that these are the sort of policies you, that we are on the opposite side of. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Yes. Melinda. Hello. <laughs> can you hear me? Sorry. Um, so, okay, this is a huge issue for me. My mother only recently got into housing last year. Um, 
it was a horrible uphill battle that I would never wish on my worst enemy. The only reason that she was finally able to get into housing is that I was able to convince her probation officer, multiple social workers, her psychologist, and a handful of other people to even talk to me. So that, that is, okay, that's worth mentioning. There are multiple types of homeless people. There are the chronically homeless, like my mother, who is severely mentally ill, who's not able to speak for herself in an educated way because she believes that the government is out to get her. Why would she accept help? Okay, there you go. Then we have people who are perfectly willing, who are about to be kicked out of their homes, who would be more than happy to accept help. That's not what we're talking about in downtown LA. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Patty. Well, first of all, I wish I knew the answer to all of it because I'd take care of it immediately. It's a big issue, but I think one of the things that's really important is to take a look at, as some people have said, all the various parts of this problem and the various demographics. It isn't one, one issue, it's many. My own personal focus, and many of you know this, is that there are children in Skid Row who are not being able to be raised properly. They don't get proper schooling. I want to help the children first. I want to help the families. Uh, I adopted a child who was on Skid Row. I know what happens to them there. I understand the issues. More importantly, there is someone there who absolutely has a solution to this piece of it. And his name is Andy Bales. This man has put a place up in the valley and now one down in South LA that is absolutely the perfect place to take these unhoused families, help the parents to be able to take care of it, and bring them on. There's Patty. grass, there's places for the... Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you. Pat Barrett. First of all, thank you very much for the question, number one. Number two is I don't have the ability or the wherewithal to solve the problem, but there are many issues at hand. There's county, there's politicians, there's the city and so forth. And I heard a lot of many good ideas that everybody came up to. Well, we have to remember that we were an advisory board and how can we impact this? My feeling is that we can have a town hall meeting, have people come in and give us our ideas. Form a committee within DLANC, have another town hall meeting, form a committee and have a proposal telling the commission a formal proposal, this is what we want. We want to end homelessness. We want to put the city and county together with a project manager. We also want to have, with all the ideas that were here, we're very good, education, foster care, kids and older people, what we can do, HHH and so forth. Come together as a team to make a dream come true. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you, Pat. And Ryan Afari. I'm gonna start talking really, really fast because I got about 20 minutes of content to get into one minute. Um, I focus on actionable solutions here. All this stuff, it breaks all our hearts 100%, but the only way we're gonna get ourselves out of this mess is by building more supply. Downtown has built 20% of the new housing supply on less than 5% of downtown's land. Because of that, we've reduced effective rent just over the last year in downtown of over 10%, okay? In addition to that, Affordable housing doesn't get built unless housing gets built. A lot of this affordable housing is percentages of market rate buildings that we're building throughout downtown. In addition to that, nonprofits using HHH money are spending $700,000 a unit because special interests are digging their hands in the pockets of all the people. We go, you know, me and my slate, we go to the HHH oversight committee meetings. We yell at them. We talk about you know, stupid rules that they put to increase costs. In addition, we have to fix the coordinated entry system so that the housing that we do build for permanent supportive housing actually serves the people of downtown. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ryan. All right. Wonderful job, everybody. I'd just like to remind everybody watching at home that after this portion, we're gonna go to you, the audience, um, to answer your questions in the, in the comments on this Facebook um, live stream. So make sure you do Place those comments in the comments there. We are recording them as we go. On to the next question. This question is from Lisa from Bunker Hill. Lisa asks, what is your plan for interacting with constituents on an ongoing basis? What's your plan for interacting with city council and other elected officials on our behalf? 
Thank you. And first, we are going to go right back to you, Brian. I don't, I don't like to always be first. Uh, can you start the clock again? Sorry, I was just, I need a second. I don't know what the question is. I need a second to compile my thoughts. I'm sorry, could you ask the question again, Marcus? Sure, absolutely. What is your plan for interacting with constituents on an ongoing basis? What's your plan for interacting with city council and other elected officials on our behalf? One minute on the clock. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you, yeah. In terms of out outreach to constituents, um, I'll be honest, the majority of the work that I do is with planning and land use. And so the issues that we deal with are things like alcohol licenses, conditional use permits, um, approvals for development, that kind of stuff. So we basically outreach to, you know, the people within the neighborhood based on um, conversations that we have around specific projects, dealing with neighbor input as they come into our meetings. More importantly, in terms of reaching our elected officials, you know, neighborhood council has a very specific mandate as to how we can opine on certain things that happen within the city. The, the most common of which is a CIS, a community impact statement. So I've co-sponsored and you know, helped introduce multiple community impact statements that are basically in reference to specific legislation or specific things that are happening downtown in which we give our opinions on that kind of stuff. Um, in addition to that, obviously we have a specific outreach team. Marcus, obviously you've been ahead of that. Sorry, I'm out of time. Thank you so much, Ryan. Pat. Pat, you're muted. Okay. First of all, being a D-Lank member in South Park for three years, I walk the streets and I talk the talk and I meet with my constituents all the time. And that's how I found out how to do things and get things done. Number one is they want a doggy park. So I went to city planning and that's something that they and talked to them and that's something that they put in their proposals that they're hoping to get. I meet with them and that's how I got by working with bid and other people drains, you know, working with them that they take it and do it and putting um, screens on the drains. I also believe in the CIS. Again, we, it's only specific on what they do. And we have a very powerful CIS department that speaks up for the people. And then we have outreach, which I helped with um, Marcus and talked to him about getting out the first newspaper. And by talking to other people, I'm also having um, trees and I continue to do the same as we go on is talk the talk and walk the walk. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Pat. Patty. Well, I think this reminds me of something that Sean brought up and I think Tony also, this idea of whether we weaponize D-Link. If we are gonna communicate with City Hall, if, and we're only allowed to, to communicate with city agencies, we do cheat a little bit, but that's it. The only way we can do that and really communicate and have the ability to get the ideas that we've gotten from our constituents to City Hall is if we have a good solid relationship with them and a friendly enough relationship so that they're willing to listen to us. So weaponizing d -Lank is not the best way to handle it. The best way to handle it is to have good solid relationships. Don't take anything but be there for our people and get along with everybody. Thank you so much, Patty. Melinda. Hello. Um, so my plan would hopefully be to continue what I'm already doing, which is I'm a small business owner. I talk to people from the community daily and people who also own businesses in my neighborhood. I'd stop in, talk to them, try to figure out what we can do to problem solve together, keep our customers safe, keep ourselves safe. Um, and then I also nerdily enough, very nerdy, run the the Facebook group for my building, um, which is right there on the nickel. Um, and we deal with a lot of really interesting issues with our building. So I, I do try to keep in touch with all 250 people on that group on a regular basis. Um, I also used to run a women's group that I formed, but unfortunately it was just really hard to keep it going because we didn't have, it was completely self-funded where we were allowing women to come and learn donation-based self-defense classes and getting to know people from the community. Anybody could come, including women from Skid Row. Thank you, Melinda. Peter. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think a very clear direct answer is 
empower people. If people know ways that they can feel they are meaningfully participating in the processes that D-Link is going through, they will want to participate more and we will be able to reach people that way. Um, like people need to know that they can send in an item, request it be on the agenda and it has to be put on the agenda. People need to know that they can be on a committee. They don't have to be elected. They can vote, they can come and they can be part of the process. Um, people need to know that D-Link can actually send you to speak on our behalf at a city board or commission. That's a power given to us by in the city charter. We can also request those responsible for city services to come to our meetings and answer questions. These are all very specific things that we need to educate people about because I think a lot of people aren't fully aware of what the powers of the neighborhood council are and the ways in which they, they can be leveraged to gain uh, influence um, for our neighborhood and for our community. Um, and so I think if we can educate people about what those are, if we make that really clear, if we make Thank that- Thank you a point, so much, Peter. Um, it can really help. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kevin. Yeah, I think one thing that needs to be made very, very clear is our role is to be an advocate for our community and to elevate our community's needs. Um, unlike Patty, I do not think the role of D-Link is to be friends with the city council or to be buddies with them. That is not our job. Our job is to tell them what our communities need, whether or not they like that or not. Um, they are working for us and we need to make sure that what they're doing is in the interests of of the downtown LA community. Um, you know, another way to engage people is to actually publicly post about meetings as required by the Brown Act. You know, this was not publicly posted. It wasn't on the website. Uh, there wasn't 70, 72 hours notice for, as required by law. Uh, it was only accessible on Facebook. It was via a non-accessible uh, tool via screen reader. It wasn't in a language other than English. There are a lot of ways that we can help reach our community so that they can be active participants. Uh, D-Link is not doing those things. And I will, thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Pablo. Like Kevin and Peter said, the tools are there to get the community involved, be it getting them aware of committees they can join, statements they can make, or um, forums they can attend. We can do more in that, in that area. As far as working with elected officials goes, like Kevin said, I'm not here to be their friend. The progressive slate isn't here to be their friend. We're here to be your voice. We're here to keep them honest and keep them accountable keep them transparent. That's what we're here for. And that's what we're going to do. Thank you, Pablo. Kate. Yeah, um, I would like to say that we absolutely do need to weaponize D-Link. This is literally a channel to advocate for our community's interest to City Hall, and we need to be doing that. Um, D-Link should be building relationships with city council so that we can get our interests to them in a you know friendly and productive way, but we also need to be holding them accountable to the interests of the people in the community. And the whole process needs to have a lot more public engagement and transparency. We need to let people know that they can submit agenda items to the meetings and serve on D-Link committees. Right now, that process isn't very well publicized um, and it's not very accessible. Um, we need uh, to continue virtual meetings after the pandemic. Um, we need to include translation services for people who don't speak English, and we need to make sure that all of our meetings are publicized um, ahead of time so that people can participate if they choose to. Thank you, Kate. Tony. So as, uh, as board members, we don't act unilaterally. We work together as a group. Um, and we also are advocates for our community members. So I can't, you know, it's it's not my place to impose an agenda uh, on a group of people. It's my place to listen to what people are saying and help them get their voice heard through the DLAC board. We have many ways to do that. We have, you could do it through uh, helping to write a CIS about a particular issue. Um, you could do that by participating in in one of the um, one of the groups, one of the um, uh, one of the groups on D on DLAC and uh, and get involved in that way. Um, and, and we discuss collaboratively how we're going to solve a problem or attack an issue. Um, but, you know, we, we don't, we don't weaponize, we don't weaponize dealing. That's not what we do. Um, and, uh, and Peter Kloon actually came to me with, uh, with an issue and I, I helped him find the right conduit in order to get that, that issue heard. And I hope that he did it, but, you know, Thank we you, also have a process. Thank you so much, Tony. Joan. Here we go. <laughs> um, I think that 
and what Dealing needs to do, and I would love to be the catalyst in doing this, is really enlisting and engaging more participation. And I think you do that with more communication. And, you know, we certainly have identified ways that we can do that. What we need to do is pull in more people who can help us get the word out to really uh, create a, a talent pool. Uh, possibly a mentoring program of young students. You know, again, I think that the whole idea of, of going to UCLA, going to, U, uh, to USC and you know, uh, encouraging students to uh, work with our committee, committee chairs and uh, you know, so that it can be part of their, they can be part of the future of building all of this as well. Even high schools, you know, we can work with high schools to bring students in to help us get some of this work done because you can't do it by yourself. There just isn't enough time to do it. But again, I think increasing the communication is Thank really you something. so much. Thank you so much, Joan. You're welcome. Rick. Mm. Two ideas. Uh, one, I'm a half glass type of guy, glasses full type of guy. <clears throat> and since the questioner asked from Bunker Hill, I'll invite you on any afternoon to come take a walk with Maddie and I, my dog, as we go through the neighborhood. It's one on one and it's very simple. And if you want to invite me to something at your building or your office, uh, you're entitled to do that. I have the benefit of having a white beard and being retired, so I can make a little time for this, and I'm committed to do that. That's one way of listening. The other thing is, let's be practical here. We have one city councilman who may care about DLAC. Uh, I'm still waiting to see if that's true. Uh, there are 15 city councilmen. There are 99 neighborhood councils. They all have their own neighborhood council. The way the council works, if it's in their district, they'll care about it. If it's not, they'll listen to their fellow councilmen and maybe think about something. So we have to work Thank with you, our city year. councilman's office. Thank uh, you. Clear and simple. Thank period. you. Thank you, Ray. Cody. So uh, it sounds to me that uh, uh, going back to what Tony was saying, uh, we work, we don't work, you know, laterally, it's a collaborative uh, mission here. So uh, it, our, our outreach, uh, like, I, I think that we need to uh, acknowledge that there's a lot of residents out here in this uh, uh, downtown neighborhood community that are not aware of the neighborhood council uh, that have been here for years and that are moving in, uh, that are homeless um, and uh, other forms of life. Uh, how, how do we approach uh, bringing them in, uh, welcoming them to a seat at the table? Uh, I, I think that's important, you know, getting the information out there. And I don't necessarily have an answer for that. Uh, I can say that I myself am very open. I have a big red beard. So I stand out in the community as you see me walking around. People can feel free to approach me very nicely and I, I'll open up a conversation. Um, so it, it sounds like it's definitely an issue that we need to discuss. Thank you, Cody. Claudia. So I can safely say that I'm the person that uses business cards the most. I feel like I'm always running out of my delaying cards because I'm literally everywhere. And this is why I decided to run for a, a area wide instead of just historic core, because I cover all the territories. I, and uh, this is how far I'll go to talk to all my constituents. I engage everybody from Poppy to the in-house, to the business owner, to anyone that wants to talk, I am a talker. Um, but how do I reach my representatives? Well, how far would I go? I went all the way to Sacramento, drove myself twice to help pass, uh, testify in the, in, in the assembly judiciary to pass a bill that was beneficial for 25% of our downtown population. I go, you know, 5,000 extra miles. I enjoy this. This is my passion um, to make sure that we are uh, the liaisons between the community and our elected officials. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claudia. Misha. Hi. Um, so I think in the US generally, a lot of people feel that they are alienated from the political process. And um, this is true at the local level at every level of government and I think the reason I, I think that it's the responsibility and part of the reasons what reason why I'm running 
because I think it's the responsibility of the elected body and officials of uh, and elected officials to be the ones who are finding innovative ways to reach out to the community. Right now, we've seen how effective it is to use Zoom and other platforms to bring people together. Um, I put on a ton of events prior to law school. I put on events downtown. It's you can put you build partnerships. You build partnerships with local organizations with. Um, you know, small business coalitions, like there's so many ways that you can outreach to different stakeholders that represent, you know, different orgs that represent stakeholders and build those partnerships. Um, we could build partnerships with other neighborhood councils. Um, I didn't get to all parts of this question, but thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Nisha. Jehan. I feel like um, the communication um, with D-Link, um, bridging the gaps between the constituents and I guess, um, city council or uh, larger bodies is really all about um, the communication. So the goal would be communication is targeting however people want to be communicated with. I know sometimes elderly people aren't on like social media. So the idea is that um, we get on foot, we target them, we target this small business owners, we target um, the younger um, um, individuals that are on Facebook um, and also make sure that everyone knows that they're open and to either show up in person or be a virtually. Um, but in all honesty, I think we all want to be targeted in different ways. But the idea is whether you're on um, the board or not, the goal is that we extend the reach of D-Link and make, um, get everyone involved. So um, that could include even just getting um, people to commit to small portions, because I think um, the goal would be to make change. And we do have to get um, our elected officials to know that we exist. And by extending just beyond our board members Thank that we can make that happen. Thank you so much, Jim. As someone who's run a grassroots nonprofit organization that aimed to provide social change, I know how hard it is to get people involved and to make sure that people stay involved. As someone who's new to D-Link, I, I don't know all the tools we have. I know there are tools there. I'm committed to being a part of that change and making sure that we're as open and, and outreach to as many people as possible. And I'm excited to be a part of that change. Thank you so much, Jim. Sean. Hi there. Uh, I have to start out with saying that I'm so proud of our DTLA2021.com slate. Um, these are people that have their boots on the ground. These are the people that already have their ear to the community. These are people, for them, engaging their community isn't theoretical. They're already doing it. Um, I think our outreach does need an improvement. Um, you know, it's been a very complicated year, uh, but I think that, uh, you know, we have to involve everyone. We have to get the message out to everyone that they're included and that they're he heard. When people are not heard, they only get louder. And I have to say that I'm so proud of my slate because they're not bullies. We have all agreed to work with one another and we're not out there to bully anyone. It's a positive message here. Thank you, Sean. Jacob. So as a couple of candidates mentioned, uh, Zoom has been great. And there's actually a bill pending in the state assembly to require all Brown Acted meetings to continue virtual uh, uh, ways to view public comment. Even if that should not pass, I think that's something a D Lang should absolutely do. As well, in the meeting, they have a way to submit public comments online that are included in the file for the motion. I think D Lang should be absolutely doing that for those that cannot make to make it to a meeting to ensure as many voices as possible is heard. Now, as far as communicating it back, um, one I think it was Peter mentioned that the uh, we can send a representative. You actually get five minutes for public comment if you've submitted a statement, not two. But I also think it's important to do this at the committee level and not always at the council level, because that's where all the action happens, the amendments and where we can have the most change. So it's staying on top of these and communicating our voice as early as possible in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Kevin. Yeah, um, this is a good question. And I think uh, participation in politics in general is something that's seen by a lot of people as not for them. And what I think uh, is in the purview of D-Link is to change that. Um, there's a reason this perception exists. Um, it's things like uh, 
meetings like this one not being posted in an accessible manner with advanced time. Um, it's things like the website's calendar being difficult to access. It's things like ballot requests requiring all sorts of documentation and an extra step and a different calendar. And so what ends up happening is only the people who are really engaged uh, are able to participate. And ordinary people who you know work all the time uh, or you know have are just trying to live their lives aren't as able to be engaged in, in neighborhood council processes. So uh, we have a platform, a betterdtla.com, where we get into ways that we can improve uh, public access to meetings. Thank and I you, think Dominic, we'll Debbie. Month after Thank this. you very much. Thank you, Debbie. Um, so echoing what many others have said, I think the D-Link can really do better on outreach. I honestly didn't know about D-Link until Tony was running for D-Link a couple of years ago, and that's how I learned about it. Um, so things like resident meetings, Facebook groups, um, I'm really involved in my building Facebook group, and they're always looking for how to voice their concerns. They just don't know where to go. So um, outreach is really key. I would want to leverage experienced D-Link members to learn how to relay messages back to city council, city hall and committees. Um, and I think it's actually really important to have a good relationship with your uh, city councilman because we can see from the Venice Neighborhood Council, they've had a, a complete disconnect with um, their councilman Bonin and it, it's just led to deteriorating living conditions in Venice and they just don't engage with each other which we definitely don't want for downtown. Thanks. Thank you so much. Debbie, we appreciate that. Well, that ends this portion of uh, the forum on our uh, uh, pre-submitted questions. Everyone is doing so great. We're now gonna move on to our qu questions that have been submitted to the audience. It's still time to uh, ask your questions for the next 30 minutes. We're gonna stay at one minute so everyone can get um, their, uh, their whatever they need to say in. So the first question, and this is gonna be, we're gonna start with you again, Debbie. Question, first question is from Lane. I'd love to hear um, candidates talk about urging the city council to use FEMA to seize hotels. Is this something that the city and or mayor can do right now? How do you feel about that? We'll start with you, Debbie. So this is actually something that I've been reading a lot about just because I've been trying to figure out how DLANC as an organization can advise the city on getting available housing up quicker. And basically what I, how I feel about this, I, I think that trying to use FEMA or like things are an imminent domain to seize private property from entities like hotels, it, it's gonna lead to so many lawsuits that I, I don't know if that's something that the city wants to pursue the same way that they don't wanna pursue constantly criminalizing homeless people and, and moving them and sweeping them and moving them around because it just leads to litigation that at least the settlements that doesn't really solve the problem. It's just band-aids for lawyers to make money off of. Thank you, Debbie. Kevin. Thank you, yeah. Um, so if, if homelessness is the overarching crisis facing our city that you know everyone here agrees that it is, um, it's imperative to support the free money that's being proposed from FEMA, from the Biden administration to uh, municipalities like LA. Hotels are 100% reimbursable to put unhoused people in them. They're currently sitting mostly empty because of the pandemic. So the hotels are losing money, the people who work at the hotels are losing employment, and people are dying on the streets at a rate that's only gone up since the pandemic began. We're now at about five a day. So this is a crisis, and it's not a matter of, oh, seizing private property because they're being reimbursed. Um, but at the same time, the city does have the authority to do so under its emergency powers. The mayor has this power, the city council has this power, and they've dragged their feet putting this on the agenda. And I'm, I'm proud to be part of a coalition that's fought against Thank that. So this needs to be uh, implemented. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jacob. So yeah, it's a huge issue right now. Under the local emergency period, I did want to make a point of clarification. The city council themselves can't actually do this, but Mayor Garcetti absolutely does the power. It lies unilaterally with him under the local emergency period. I think something we need to examine in this and listening to a city council report back recently, uh, there are over a thousand hotel rooms which were rejected by the city and the county. They came to him and said, we want to participate. 
The city, for whatever reasons, did not accept them, neither did the county. When asked why, nobody could give a clear and definitive answer. We need to start taking and looking at these people that want to be a part. Now, what I don't want to see is that the local emergency period ends and these people can no longer be in these rooms. So I think we need a permanent supportive solution. We need to examine what is going on and where are the disconnects in this, and frankly, why we're taking so long to answer these questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Sean. Uh, hey there. Um, so there's a there's something called Project Room Key, and so that uh, provided hotel rooms to the unhoused, and there was a very large percentage that went unoccupied. So I think if we look at that, seizing something that was already available might be the wrong thing to do. Um, I mean, and also it just becomes a very litigious uh, issue, you know? So I think that's the wrong avenue. Um, I think that uh, we need more beds um, and, um, and that's part of the solution. All right, thank you so much, Sean. Jim. Sure, so seizing hotels is obviously not a great long-term solution. It's also not a great short-term solution because hopefully we'll be opening back up soon and those hotel rooms will not be available for much longer. That, that money from FEMA can go towards a lot of other emergency, emergency shelter um, solutions. Uh, a couple of years ago, the mayor opened up the, the emergency shelter by the El Pueblo um, and that was successful. We need to be doing that all over the city. I, I've mentioned before, I've seen a lot of other proposals for building these cheaply, uh, pre-manufactured. It's about finding the land. So um, not a lot we can do as part of D-Link, but, um, but we should be advocating for it, yep. Thank you, Jim. Jayhan. Uh, yeah, I am familiar with the project um, room key. Um, and like Sean said, I think the issue was um, there was a lot of individuals that I know that didn't actually want to be housed in hotels. Um, so the solution would be creating um, a long-term uh, solution that people are also willing to um, partake in. Um, because the goal with providing housing is to make it available. Um, I wasn't aware that there was um, funding um, about the funding from FEMA, but I'm like, if there's funding there, most definitely use it. But again, um, I'm not really um, into putting band-aids on a situation. Like Debbie said, I'd uh, much advocate for long-term permanent solution. And let's just face it, hotels don't have um, I don't know. Sometimes there's not even uh, places to cook or um, live like a normal home. So the goal would be to make it more um, livable and long-term solution. Thank you, Jehan. Nisha. Thanks. Um, so FEMA is emergency funding. It's not permanent. So seizing hotels doesn't mean eminent domain. The federal government is taking over the hotels. It means Emergency funding is provided to help pay for the costs and enable people to be taken off the streets and put into a warm, clean, comfortable home. Um, also, I'm a litigator, so when I hear the word litigious, I try to think to myself, well, what would the, where would the lawsuit come from? And, and in this case, you know, it, it's federal money that would be, this money would be created in partnership with the city. So, you know, I, I fully support you know, we're talking about like the, the crisis of our unhoused. When you look at LA and you look at COVID, so many people have lost their homes. I, I think that we should be pushing for this to happen. Um, and you can do, you can push for something and take a strong opinion on it and, you know, not, and, and still have a positive relationship with Thank other you. electeds. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, Claudia. Okay, so I want to point out that my, my experience with this doesn't come from my own experience. It actually comes from our, from our past board member, Betsy Starman. So when I first started in the council, she had a list of empty city properties that were good to house everybody. And not only just her, Controller Galprin, Ron Galprin's office, has a list of places that are empty. And this money from FEMA could go for retrofitting, could get these places that already belong to the city. They are there, vacant, 
there's a list. There's no, like, honestly, there's no need to look or see if a, a, a private person is going to agree to this. We have the units. This is empty. So if the question is getting, uh, I actually had a meeting with uh, our Kevin DeLeon's office. And, you know, I, I told them there is a list. Controller Galprin is the one to work with. Thank you, Claudia. And Betsy. Thank, Thank you so much. Cody. And so I've also heard of, uh, pro uh, what is a project for MP, um, and also heard that uh, there were homeless that did not want to uh, go into some of those rooms. Um, and, and, you know, knowing that there's all these rooms that are, have, uh, and hotels have remained empty uh, through the, the duration of the pandemic, it's, uh, it's shocking. Um, but then also at the same time, uh, there are, to Claudia's point, there are all these uh, empty buildings that could be, um, you know, tenant improvement to uh, TI work to, to make uh, a, a livable space very quickly. Um, so maybe, uh, you know, because LA does, uh, doesn't have a lot of freed up land where we could just take and put prefab units, which other cities are doing, have done, um, perhaps using existing structures, but the infrastructure of uh, water and heat and uh, being able to cook uh, could be the solution. Thank you, Cody. Rick. Rick, you might need to turn on your mic there. All right, let's start again. <clears throat> uh, let me start with data. Project Room Key was not a success. I do not see building programs based upon failures. Uh, secondly, the long term is what's necessary, and the hotel option doesn't provide it. We also need our hotel and our hospitality business to come back fully to employ all those people who've lost their jobs and to provide the revenue that tourists bring to this town. Remember, they all pay a lot of taxes on rent -a cars and hotels that residents would have to pay otherwise. And, and thirdly, the use of the word seize as a kid who grew up in a private business, which happened to be a motel, uh, would be great for just sending the message that LA is really the crappiest place to do business in the United States. Thanks. Thank you, Rick. Uh, Joan. Here we go. Um, well, I'm going to yield to Ryan and Rick and others who really understand this issue in more depth. But if this is the overarching issue of, you know, that we are dealing with right now, then establishing a task force, a dealing task force will prioritize these uh, issues and, you know, applied pressure uh, seems to me that we applied pressure to determine what are the most important issues and then you know, that we all collectively agree and applying pressure consistently over time with the city council. Seems effective. Great, thank you so much, Joan. Tony. I can go on for hours on this one. Um, so number one, uh, uh, it's, it's been the, the whole hotel, the project room key has been a disaster. I know this from the inside, I, I'm in the industry. I've talked to the hoteliers, I've talked to the politicians, it's been an utter disaster. Uh, more than, greater than 30% of the rooms are unoccupied, they can't get people in them. Uh, it's just a matter of fact. Um, so uh, commandeering hotels to do work on a project that's not working is not gonna be a good task. Uh, that's number one. Number two, uh, the mayor is the head of the uh, EEO, the emergency uh, uh, operation for the city. Uh, he's not declared a state of emergency. Why, I have no idea. Uh, it's, it's crazy that he hasn't done it so far. Um, he should be actually doing that and bringing in the federal government for assistance. Why this is not happening, I have no idea. The other one is we have uh, enough, uh, enough room in CD14 for 10,000 beds on Washington Street. We could put sprung structures and get people there immediately. Uh, but why are we not doing that? Thank you so much, Tony. Kate. Uh, seizing the hotels is such an obvious solution to our current homelessness problem that I can't even believe it's a point of debate. It will cost our city nothing with the FEMA money, and it will help thousands and thousands of people. It's perfectly legal for the mayor to do this right now. 
Uh, so what if the hotels try to sue? They have no legal ground to do so, and they're being compensated for rooms that are otherwise going to be sitting empty. Uh, so what if it's a, not a long-term solution? It's a short-term solution, and we currently don't have a better one. And on average, five unhoused people are dying on the streets of LA every day. So we can't keep stalling on this. There's no reason to keep stalling on it. d -Lang should be using all of their power to advocate for this with the city government. Thank you, Kate. Pablo. Yeah, just to reiterate what Kate said, if the rooms are available, if they're getting reimbursed, a temporary solution is better than no solution. Getting people off the streets in conditions that are healthier and more livable, let's do it. Let's work to apply pressure to city council and get them to work with FEMA to do it. Um, Tony said 30% of the rooms are unfilled. That means 70% have been filled and that is a success as far as I'm concerned. So let's work on those temporary solutions first and long-term solutions later, meaning livable wages, universal health care, um, et cetera. And let's get those going so we can, we can have um, long-term solutions. Thank you, Pablo. Kevin. Yeah, so I think one thing that needs to be made clear is it has always been very clear that the mayor had the power to commandeer hotel rooms and put the unhoused in there um, to comply with CDC guidelines to shelter in place safely. Um, instead, what they do is send out sweeps to displace unhoused neighbors, you know, putting them at, at grave risk of getting sick um, or dying. And in fact, you know, as Kate mentioned, a number of unhoused people are dying every single day. Um, this issue of seizing the hotel rooms or whatever you want to call it um, is plainly obvious and the city attorney actually reaffirmed that the mayor had this power and even more the Biden administration <laughs> has allowed FEMA funding 100% reimbursable a total blank check so the fact that it's not being done is a complete dereliction of duty and D-Link is silent on this and in fact the city council overwhelmingly hears from people to seize the hotel rooms and they fear even more if they held their public meetings three times a week as they were required to do. Um, so yes, commandeer the hotel rooms, make sure that people are safe. It's a clear solution. Thank you, Kevin. Peter. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I just want to start by saying I'm you know, much less concerned with the use of the word seize than I am with five people dying on the streets of Los Angeles every single day. Um, and that's where we're at right now. Um, and it is just absolutely imperative that we provide safe housing for people immediately. These rooms have been empty. They will cost the city absolutely nothing. Um, and yes, Project Room Key didn't reach the 15,000 it was supposed to, but that's because of structural fares with the city. And because they wanted to impose conditions like 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. curfews on any residents. What we need is housing that works with people, meets them where they are, that's provided to them as a service, that isn't provided to them as something, you know, hey, here you go, but here's a whole list of conditions. And you're not really deserving of it because, you know, these are all the things that you have to meet. We need to provide people housing first. And this is a way to do it for free and that will save lives in our city. And there's just absolutely no question Thank that you. it's something we have to do. Thank you so much. Belinda. So from my understanding, a lot of the issues that came to be with Project Room Key, the stipulations that they were putting in place that they were requiring people to follow involved not using drugs openly in these environments, not participating in violence and um, et cetera, et cetera. Not to say that all homeless people are violent, obviously, but if you have people who are not willing to follow those rules, uh, of course they're gonna wanna go back out on the street because they're used to living a life a certain way that they're able to have the freedom to do the things that they, they do. Um, that being said, you know, it, it's like, how do you convince the people who would accept the help if they were in their right mind to accept the help? So you can't just throw a bunch of people into a hotel room, treat it like it's Melrose Place and then see what happens. It's not really a solution. If we accept FEMA funds, we have to use it for bridge housing, mental health care, reaching out to people and convincing them that they're, they should accept care and then also putting them in permanent solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda. Patty. Well, Claudia stole my thunder. So I just, I, what I wanted to say and what I think she said so well is we've got all these buildings owned by the city and even more owned by the county, empty, not doing anything. And they're, they're digging their heels in about not doing anything with them. What we should be trying to do is get these places ready 
they can stay there forever. They don't have to leave when the, when the pandemic is over. So why aren't we? Talk to Ron Galbrin. He has the solution. Let's get that done first. Thank you, Patty. Pat. Thank you very much. First of all, I don't believe seizing a hotel and using that as an alternate. There are a lot of other recommendations that we can do. You've got to remember that we can only give recommendations and we can write letters and <clears throat> go through our political process. That's number one. Number two is, yes, we do have buildings out there that we can use that Betsy has said, which is a good solution. That's number one. Number two is we need to build models and we don't have enough models to build right. it so it'll be permanent housing. That's number one. We also need to take the downtown women's center and use that model. Once they're housed, they are 90 to 95% recovery. So we have to have solutions like that. And then we can make recommendations. We can also use the Veterans Center, which also has a couple acres of land. And then that's on Wilshire near, um, and most of you know where that's at. And they're also putting tents inside of there that they can put places in there and make recommendations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. Ryan. You guys, uh, I just wanted to echo what a lot of the people have been saying here. I think the important thing about this, and at least the way I see Neighborhood Council, we're here for actionable things that will actually fix the problems. We're not here to put a banner up on a shiny new high rise and say, eat the rich, let's take the homeless and put it in the middle of it so everybody has to look at it every day. That's not the point of Neighborhood Council. I'll tell you personally, more than everybody here, I have offered the city and I've actually went and sought out uh, care providers, because I own property that amounts to over 500 beds of usable housing. I have been chasing the state, the city, the county, every single week, emailing them saying, I have an empty building here and I see homeless people on my street every day, put them in my building until I can do my adaptive reuse and restore these historic buildings. And I get a no every day of the week. That is where you have to apply pressure. It's not that we don't have enough hotel rooms. The, the state just paid a billion dollars for thousands of apartment, uh, hotel buildings that they bought just for permanent supportive housing. That's where we need to put Thank the so practical much. solutions. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much. All right, we're gonna move on to our final question from the audience for the night. I'm sorry, I gotta go right back to you, uh, Ryan. The uh, question is from Kirk. There has been no talk tonight about a rise in crime in downtown. There are many people getting attacked and even murdered. Can you please speak on this and what your plans are? Go ahead, Brian. Everybody in downtown, not just the homeless, not just downtrodden people, every single person in downtown deserves to feel safe, clean, and we wanna attract people to be happy in downtown. Businesses pay the taxes that pay for all these programs. Businesses is what allows people to live in a green and sustainable way near their office in downtown. You know, we need to support the community from every angle. 100%, you've heard on this, you know, on this panel all night, the kind of stuff we do, we walk in Skid Row, we're working with actual service providers, half the people on this, you know, on our, on our existing panel, either themselves or someone they're related to has been homeless, okay? Those are clearly huge issues for downtown. But the engine that allows us to do all this progress is small businesses are the everyday residents of downtown. We need to support those people as well. That's why we advocated not to stifle free speech, but for additional police, for additional safety measures. And we should continue to do that until everybody feels safe downtown. Thank you so much, Ryan. Pat. Please unmute yourself, Pat. Thank you. Um, crime has been uprising, number one. Number two is burglaries are up 57%. And that comes from the cops and the CPAC meeting. So it does have to be changed. And yes, we do pay our taxes and we don't feel safe walking down the street at all. Um, and that has to be changed as well. We have to advocate, hopefully, to have more police working within the community. We have to advocate for better laws that can prosecute the criminals right now. They can, somebody can shoot up or they're selling drugs. There's really nothing that they can prosecute them on. They're in and out. 
So we have to speak up and change the laws and see what we can do to make this place a better and safe place because right now it is not. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Patty. Well, I just came out of, outside of my apartment after 11 months of total isolation. Uh, and the neighborhood isn't what it used to be. It, it's a little scary. There are a lot of shootings. There's a lot of knifings. Um, I'm a 73 year old woman. I do not feel that I can go out after dark by myself. I get escorts if I need to go somewhere after dark. Uh, the answer, and, and I just wanna say this, this has nothing to do with unsheltered people. This is about gangs. This is about cartels. It's about the drug industry having so much of the control because it's so lucrative in this area. And I don't think that there's anybody here who says, yep, downtown is a great place for the cartel to move in. We need help with this. Obviously, I don't have a solution. But I do know that saying that the problem is the homeless is the wrong way to go. Thank you, Patty. Melinda. I have so many things to say about this, um, but I'll keep it short. So um, as a small business owner, I used to be on Main Street, which as we all know is kind of a nightmare right now. In the two years that I was there, I was sexually assaulted, robbed multiple times. Someone tried to attack me with a shovel that I'm pretty sure he stole from a construction site. Um, I've been in, in court multiple times to try to get these people off the street. And then also just last week, I was assaulted in front of my building. Um, I won't go into detail. And a few days ago, I was stalked down the street and someone harassed me with racially motivated comments. Um, even on my way to work today, I saw a guy smoking crack openly on Spring Street. Nobody batted an eyelash, and that's an issue. Um, the main thing that, I, that I've experienced when I've spoken to the LAPD is they say their hands are tied. I saw one man openly taunting a bid member, uh, sorry, a bid security, saying, you can catch me, but I'll be back tomorrow. That's not okay. So we need to fix that. Thank you so much, Melinda. Peter. Thanks, Marcus. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think, you know, I think we can all agree that public safety is a conversation that's been happening across Los Angeles for the last year. Um, and as the neighbor council, it's really important that D-Link is able to facilitate that conversation in a productive way, that they are involved in, in understanding that community safety is so much more than just the Los Angeles Police Department, right? Community safety looks like investments in our community that provide lasting resources to uplift people. You know, downtown has been historically um, the center for experiments in sort of drastic, you know, public safety measures. You know, right now we have gaps in non-police alternatives that are being filled by business improvement districts, right? We also had experiments in Skid Row where for a while they made it the most policed place in the world, like more, more police per capita than Baghdad, right? So when we have this conversation about public safety, I think it's really important that we look to what have we been investing in so far? Thank you, Peter. And what can we invest in going Thank forward so to make real change? Thank you so much. Kevin. I think everyone wants to feel safe in their community. I think that goes without saying. Um, some of the suggestions are rather illuminating. Um, the suggestion that we further criminalize drug use um, and add more cops. Uh, if more cops solve the problem, LA would be the safest place in the entire world. We have $3 billion a year going to the police. Every single dollar that goes to the police cannot go to the actual supports that our communities need, like drug abuse treatment, like mental health care, like medical care, like permanent supportive housing, like public housing. And our budget is a zero sum game. So unless we are willing to reimagine public safety, we will not resolve this problem. Um, instead, people like the BID just the other day had a meeting on how to further criminalize the unhoused population um, and about what people could do to further call the cops on them. That is not the solution. It should not be the solution. And it's really irresponsible, especially knowing how murderous the LAPD is, how dangerous they are to unhoused people and black and brown populations. That's wrong. Thank you, Kevin. Pablo. Like my slate mates have said, we need to re-envision public safety and accept that it's not all about policing. As Kevin said, if that were the case, we'd be the safest city in the country. We spend $3 billion on police. 
it's laughable to think that spending more is a solution. Also, to criminalize more people is not a solution. To criminalize drug users is not a solution. We need long-term solutions to make people safer and to make the community safer for all. That means lifting people up, giving them the resources for long-term success, be it living wages, be it healthcare, be it police reform, police accountability, and a city council that stands up for them. These are solutions that will really make the public safe. Thank you so much, Pablo. Kate. Yeah, as some of my slate mates have mentioned, police don't prevent crime. Police respond to crime once it's been committed, um, and often they actually end up making the problem worse by criminalizing problems like homelessness and drug addiction instead of actually solving them and um, just keeping people trapped in this pipeline of you know, living on the streets, living in poverty and living in jail. Um, instead of playing reaction like that, we just need to address the root problems of crime um, instead of just bringing in more cops. Um, that means redirecting some of the LAPD's multi-billion dollar budget toward uh, public services like housing, um, public schools, healthcare, including mental health care, drug treatment programs, and hiring professional social workers to respond to calls instead of just police. All of that can actually make us more safe, the entire community, and um, it can help solve problems instead of um, just playing catch up and trying to respond to them retroactively. Thank you so much, Kate. Tony. So there's been a lot of talk about the long-term uh, addressing uh, of, of crime, you know, and in, in, in systemic issues that we have. That's all fine and dandy, that's great. Uh, we need to do those things. But we have immediate needs. We have shootings happening every day. We have knifings happening every day. Uh, we gotta address those things. We, gotta short, we have to deal with the short-term problems. Um, yeah, in Baghdad, uh, that's great. You know, they can shoot you and cart you away without any, any without having to go to court. So um, they have an advantage um, in dealing with that kind of thing. We don't. We're, we live in a democracy. You can't shoot people in the head and take them away. Uh, we have to deal with things the proper way here. So um, we have a problem. So we have to find a way to deal with that problem in a short-term way. Um, and some of it might be increasing policing. It might be other things. We need to sit down with the LAPD and with our constituents and figure out, okay, how are we gonna address this issue? Thank you, Tony. Joan. Okay. I first uh, came down to downtown Los Angeles before the Renaissance. It was, I mean, we when we were looking at properties to create, to establish businesses in, we had to step over crack addicts, okay? It was really bad. One of the things that I know personally that is happening here is not just LAPD we are missing, it's the presence of the private patrol and the security that was supplied by open businesses. If we can, you know, it's like we got to open the businesses, you know, before that whole group of people come in, uh, you know, and they actually, again, every time we opened a new business, it's like crime, I'm not saying it disappeared, but it dissipated. It really, you know, the crime rates went down in the neighborhoods. So uh, I think that's, you know, again, it's, it's such a bigger issue here in terms of what we're really missing. Um, you, but what I worry about- Thank is you so least, much, Joan. Thank you so much this time. Rick. Before I got on d -Link, I was tracking uh, police in downtown LA. Uh, and what I discovered in talking to the officers is that whenever there's a special event or, or something where they need officers, they pull them from downtown. This is straight from officers talking to me. And I said, how many officers do we have? And I think the relevant number on any one point on the beat walking as a deterrent was maybe 40. And they said, it'd be great if we had 80. There is a deterrent effect for officers on the beat and we have totally lost that as the police responsibility. I agree totally this is more than a police solution, but what we're talking about in the short term is what did the, the uh, LAPD give us in downtown? They were gonna give us a study. Well, isn't that nice? They didn't give us Jack. Uh, and uh, I think you know we need to look at all these solutions, but we need to not lose track of, don't get lost on $3 billion, it's how many, shoe leathers are on the sidewalks down here. Thank you, Rick. Thank, Thank you so much. Cody. 
So, uh, you know, I, I think that all of us on uh, the panel tonight and most of the people listening all interact here in downtown, whether you live or you work down here, and you probably have a story of um, how you've seen a crime, you've been a victim of a crime, uh, you have an app that tells you about all the crimes that are going on on a daily basis, going off right now, um, sirens in the background uh, where I'm at. And uh, so it's happening around us all the time. Um, and it's gone only gotten worse during the pan pandemic um, with COVID. And then uh, what I've heard about uh, PPE loans and uh, um, uh, criminal entities coming in and using that and taking advantage and using downtown as uh, their criminal criminal playgrounds. Really, this is what it is. Uh, you know, I, I, I do feel that it may get a little bit better when we start uh, populating the streets again after the pandemic, but still, there's not a solution um, that, that I'm aware of. So we Thank need you. to work on it. Thank you so much. Claudia. Hi. So first of all, I want to take I want to thank Melinda for sharing her story of abuse in downtown. And uh, I want to reinforce this for everybody here that's been saying that they want to listen to how other people feel and be inclusive. Well, my downtown experience, the experience of a single woman in the downtown is not the same as a single man, it's not the same as a couple, it's not the same as a family. So if you think that immediately it's immediately safe for you, and I see a lot of my, my male colleagues here, by colleagues I mean everybody that is running, not just on my slate, that can go freely anywhere they want and jog. It's not the same for me. I was followed uh, in, into City Hall. Someone jumped the fence chasing me down. And we have 1,300 registered sex offenders. You don't know what it is like being a single woman in downtown. So don't tell me you, how I'm supposed to feel safe. Thank you, Claudia. That's what I would like to say. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, Melinda, for sharing that. Yeah. Thank you, Claudia. Nisha. Hi. Yeah, so I, I just want to put the last year in context. We just went through the biggest economic crisis since the Great Depression. We have lost in this country millions and millions of jobs, including downtown. People have lost their homes. People have been stuck in their home, jobless, turning back to addictions that maybe they'd kicked. So when you're talking about violent crime, what my slate is, when we talk about reimagining public safety, we're talking about all of the things that keep people safe that, again, get to the root of crime. We know what it looks like to police the public. We know what it looks like to put more cops in the street, to increase their guns, to increase their arms. I've experienced harassment in downtown LA. I take public transit or pre-COVID every single day into downtown LA. I've had men expose themselves to me, follow me. I've had all kinds of scary things happen to me too. And yet I've also had the experience of myself and my family members experience harassment from the police. So I do not advocate for increasing policing. I do believe that more Thank funding you. should be redirected and we should think about safety yeah. holistically. Thank, Thank you. you so yes. Thank you. Jehan. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to comment as um, Cody had mentioned um, about us having um, like a more devices where we're documenting um, crimes. I just think of um, it'd be nice if we could just as public citizens just be more accountable for each other as residents um, and possibly even consider doing that through documentation. I know that California, I just began looking this up today. Um, um, has some strict laws when it comes in regards to recording people when it comes to voice. But let's face it, on Citizen App, we see people documenting all the time um, crimes going down. It just seems like it'd be nice to just have like better footage and better imaging of, of their faces so people could actually be held accountable. Um, I'm not necessarily for, um, uh, I guess, like targeting people that are committing crimes, um, because I think um, a few people had mentioned that that's an issue with criminalizing certain individuals. I think there's a difference between criminalizing individuals and people just blatantly having Thank a disrespect you. for um, the rights of others. Thank you so much. Jim. So I think I'm very much in the middle on these issues, like most of America is. I think that like what everyone has said here today, that a lot of things can be true at the exact same time. Um, 
I shouldn't have to bite my lip to say something positive about the police, but clearly at these during these times, getting rid of police or calling them, you know, or or, or saying that we we should reduce the foot patrols at this moment is really not correct. Also, patrolling more is also not correct. It's not going to solve the problem. Solving these problems is is takes looking at the root cause of why we're experiencing them, and it, it involves getting people the help and the services that they need to get off the street. Like what someone said about the downtown women, downtown women's center earlier, once you get them the treatment they need, they have a far less likely chance to re-enter the street. Those are the root problems, and that's what we, what we really should be focusing on, not arguing about whether or not we need police. Thank you, Jim. Sean. Hey there. Uh, so Kate brought up uh, addiction and, and treatment, but I didn't really hear a solution. Um, you know, in March 2019, um, alcohol and drug-related hospitalizations cost the county $6 billion. Now, think, I wonder how much it costs, like, the city, you know, like, uh, in, in regards to uh, policing. So, um, you know, what's the solution? Um, part of it is uh, we need more inpatient mental health beds. We need to incentivize recovery. We need more beds. When it was time for me to recover, there was waiting lists. I couldn't get in anywhere. You have to incentivize. You have to give people beds, give them food, give them a safe place to be to recover. You have to give them yoga. You have to give them alternatives to the ism. And um, that's part of it. I mean, but also the other Thank thing you, is John. we have to Thank mentor you, our homeless. Yes, thank you so much, Sean. Jacob. Hi, so yeah, I, but some, what some of the other candidates mentioned is absolutely correct. Much of the crime spikes are pandemic induced because we're seeing it across the nation, not just in Los Angeles. Uh, it's affecting all of us. As of 30 days ago, 61% of all homicides this year were against unhoused people. Now, when we take a look at the city budget, regardless of where you stand on defunding the police, if we're spending 54% of the unrestricted budget on policing, we're doing it wrong. And you're right, the LAPD will be the first to tell you they don't prevent crime. Perhaps they, we should be concentrating more on that. I think the city council disbanded their ad hoc committee on police reform entirely prematurely. We need to have these conversations about systemic change. And if the city council won't bring that back, I certainly think d -Link should have an ad hoc committee to advise how we feel. There'll probably be fireworks with the difference of opinions in that conversation, but that's kind of what we're here and what it's about. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Kevin. Thanks. So yeah, my slate mates have really hit well on what public safety means. Uh, it means investing in the things that actually keep us safe and prevent crime. And we know the police aren't equipped to do that. And uh, the things like housing and healthcare and, and like Sean said, drug treatment programs, even yoga, all of those things uh, prevent crime more than policing ever could. But guess where the money for those things come from? It comes from the police budget. And, you know, it's no question that crime has been up lately, especially during the pandemic. But this has been an ongoing conversation in Los Angeles over the past year or two. The 2020 election was largely about reimagining public safety. It's what George Gascon ran on, and he, he won DTLA actually by a three to one margin. His strongest support was in the historic core. It's what Measure J was about, which won by even larger margins, Nithya Raman. Uh, in December, Loyola did a survey that showed 62% of Angelinos support redirecting funding from police to other social programs. That's what defund the police means to me. That's what it means to reimagine public safety and the majority of Angelinos support that. And that's what I would support uh, um, dealing. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. Debbie. So I think this, this question is from Kirk. I think what he's addressing is, is the robberies and the uh, shootings. I don't think those are necessarily homeless related. I do think they are more related to gangs. And I've read that in Highland Park, they've confirmed that an uptick or citywide is due to increased gang violence. And this is due to poverty fallout from COVID. So unfortunately, until our country you know, stops reopening and re removing mask mandates prematurely. I don't know when this is going to end because we can't ever reopen fully until the, we get a handle on the pandemic. So I think the best thing to do is do the outreach to our neighbors, to the residents and business owners and stakeholders and also the homeless. What would they want to see in terms of better public safety? I personally have been promoting the bid to everyone, renters who think that they're just for the businesses. Everybody 
gets to use the bid, they're from everyone's property tax. If you're a renter, you're indirectly paying property tax too. So the first thing I do is use the bid. If you're afraid to walk alone at night, the bid can escort you. Thank you so much, Debbie. And that concludes our questions from the audience. We are now going to move on to our final section of the night, which are our one minute closing statements. We will go right back to you, Debbie. Oops, sorry, I had to unmute. Yes, no um, Marcus, so, I'm sorry. Can we, can we all just get like a 30 second pause before we do that? I feel like maybe we need some time to collect our thoughts. Okay. You have plenty of time. You're last now. <laughs> Go ahead, Debbie. <laughs> um, so downtown is my home. It's the first place I live in LA and I grew up in LA going to little Tokyo Chinatown downtown since I was a kid because my parents worked here. Um, it's the first place that actually brought me joy that I didn't think I could get without moving to like a big city like London or Tokyo. I think the last few years have really exposed how vulnerable our community is. So many people have moved out just because, you know, they were over city living with all the city amenities closing because of COVID. So I hope that my responses tonight really demonstrate my conviction to the downtown community. Um, we have the opportunity to really refresh how we progress and grow because we're all about growth here. We have plenty of new buildings and projects to keep growing in. Uh, we should reflect on the past missteps, especially with our former councilmen and maybe try different approaches. Um, this time try to be maybe more inclusive and focus on diversity and equity. Um, and that I think ultimately improves quality of life. Um, thanks, I'd be honored to get your vote. Thank you so much, Debbie. Kevin. Yeah, thanks for having this forum. Um, I think it was a good discussion that really showed um, a uh, difference of opinion on several key issues. Um, one that I want to hit on right now, though, is just what the role of a neighborhood council is, because I, I truly do believe that neighborhood council is meant to uh, hold city council to account. That's literally its purpose. And so to run for this position is inherently a political position. It means you are entrusted with power and to not use that power would be an abdication of that power. So I'm running for office because there are people in city, uh, in city office who have power and don't use it. And it is our job as D-Link to yes, weaponize our power to punch up at them, not to physically throw punches, not to punch down, not to punch sideways, but to really hold people in office account. And you know, this is something that we've been uh, running on a betterdtla.com and I hope our slate has your vote. Thank you so much, Kevin. Jacob. So I really just want to thank everyone. I think it's pretty amazing that there are this many people that are willing to come out, that are willing to say, I'm going to set aside, you know, hours and hours of my day and week and month to help make downtown a better place. There are multiple different slates. There are people that aren't slates. There are people that do and don't agree with the solution, but this is how we make downtown better we come together and we have these discussions. And I think the more people we involve, whether or not you may agree with their views, this is what we need. We need everyone at the table. This is my home. I've lived in 13 different states and four foreign countries. I could never really answer where I'm from. And now where somebody asks me where I'm from, it's from here. And I want us to succeed, everybody, every stakeholder and elected or not, you know, I'll keep trying to help do that. And I hope that's what we can all achieve together. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. Sean. Uh, hey there. So yes, um, I would love your vote. Um, and also, you know, we've been just going through a tough time right now in downtown. Um, safety is an issue. Um, and so we have to work on that. Um, bids are a great tool. Um, they do, do not arrest anyone. They do not uh, put their hands on people and um, they are a good solution. Um, with homelessness, uh, in recovery, we have something called a sponsor that walks someone through a recovery. And if each person reached out to one person, one of the 60,000 people that are on house and mentor them and help them get to appointments, help them find housing, help them find food, that will make a difference on a personal level. We have so many people here in LA that care. And so that's one solution. Thank you so much, Sean. Jim. So I'm new to Daylink and uh, new to local politics, if you may. And I, 
I think that a lot everyone here is coming from a good place and has a their heart in the downtown community. I certainly do. I've been trying to work for many years on uh, making sure that everyone's voices are heard. I'm happy to work with each and every person here, whether or not I disagree with you or not. I think it's all very healthy and I'm looking forward to uh, improving downtown going forward. Thank you, Jim. Jehan. Well, there's a lot of negatives. I still like to consider the positives of downtown LA. Um, I would just like to say that I'm committed um, to loving it enough, to sticking around and to trying to make it better and hope that that can be collaborative um, regardless of um, if I'm lucky enough to secure a seat on D-Link, I plan on still uh, being active as well, regardless. Thank you, Jehan. Misha. Um, I also want to say thank you to everybody. Um, I One of the things that I think makes the U.S. an amazing place to live is public discourse, and it's wonderful. It's been a wonderful opportunity to have this, op, you know, hear everybody speak and, and share myself with the community. Um, I am running with a progressive slate because I think that things need to change. I think you can use your voice with force to make a change while also building coalitions with other elected people in, in office and also with community stakeholders. Um, I have not seen D-Link do that. I've been a stakeholder downtown on and off for the last 20 years, and it took a non-downtown LA stakeholder to make me aware that I am a stakeholder, even though I'm an employee um, and not a resident. Um, I value outreach. Um, if I was elected, I would do what I could to touch all of the stakeholders that there are across the city, work with other neighborhood councils, be active on social media. Um, and I'm here to listen to you and represent you. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you, Nisha. Claudia. I, so first of all, thank you, Marcus, for running this. I'm sure it's not easy to navigate all of us, but um, you know, I think it's it's uh, it's a great opportunity that goes to show the community does come together. And I love that people sent sent in their questions, and we want to keep on hearing from you. And also, I would like to say I am always available. Um, every everybody, most people that know me know that I'll make time to hear um, whoever wants to tell me an idea or complain. I take calls at, at believe it or not at four in the morning. Um, so, and I would like to invite also our stakeholders that are watching to join committees, come to our meetings and make public comments. Um, you know, if you have questions for, round, for now, I'm still the secretary, you can send them to me. I would love to help you um, uh, get, get acquainted on, on how you can participate more. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you, Claudia. Cody. All right, so first off, I just want to thank everybody on the panel and that's running uh, for Dean Lang Ford. Uh, the, the, you know, thank you guys. You're uh, a part that makes downtown great and will make downtown great again, hopefully. Um, uh, because it takes opposing views uh, to come together and collaborate. And then we, we, we got to take it to the city and tell them what we think, you know, what the, we have to represent the people that live here, the neighborhood. Um, I live, uh, work, and play here in downtown. It's my life. You know, um, this is I'm pretty much 24 seven in downtown um, and the opportunity to be a voice and a representative of this community that I'd, I'd be honored to. Um, so uh, again, uh, if you guys would please vote for me, I'm, I'm running for the South Park uh, business seat. Thanks. Thank you, Cody. Rick. Let me also thank everyone who's throwing their hat in the ring here. You know, these are strictly volunteer jobs with no staff support. For those of you who weren't at our last, a couple of meetings ago, we discovered that the city has cut the neighborhood engagement office's budget 40% from the high it had. So there's a statement about the position of neighborhood councils, but we as representatives and the people listening to this thing tonight and the people out there who don't know about it yet, we can engage the community. We need to engage downtown. What do we see when we see pictures of Los Angeles? It's downtown. What do most people understand about cities? They're downtown. Ours is underdeveloped, under business. Uh, it needs to grow again. It needs to be healthy. And we need to make the people, all the people in it healthy. 
However, we have to approach that from different angles. And I'm committed to work with everybody to collaborate to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Joan. Got it. OK. <laughs> OK, so first of all, thank you so much, Marcus. Uh, so whether or not I'm elected, my goal over the next two years is really to help where I can and to contribute both time and resources. Um, I, I, I think, you know, as far as I'm concerned, a priority is to really engage uh, people and to get them involved with D-Link and with each other to revitalize this community and to restore it back to, you know, health. Um, and, you know, I, I, I think I'm really, uh, you know, I'm so impressed with the people. <laughs> I, I feel like we're in good hands because we have people that are committed. And I think that's really important. And, uh, you know, it's clear there are a lot of leaders on, uh, that are running for office and also who are holding office currently. And I just want to thank all those people. That's it. Thank you so much, Joan. Mm -hmm. Tony. First of all, I'd like to thank Marcus for moderating. You did a great job. Um, and um, I'd like to thank all the panelists as, as well. It's, you know, this is a democracy and you're seeing it in action right here in front of you. Uh, so this is a really important, really important thing that we're doing right here in, in, in that respect alone. Um, and uh, I, I'd like to say that um, our, our, I'm looking at this as a very positive board um, I want this to be a very positive board. I don't want this to be a regressive board. Um, I want us to be a progressive board. Uh, in that, we need to really work together with our constituents. We really need to think the, uh, of what we're doing in a very positive way and not attacking. Um, that's, that's extremely important in a democracy uh, is to do it that way, um, especially uh, when you're in a position, an elected position. Um, and, um, uh, and, and we have 300,000 people here in downtown to work with, and we've got a lot of work to do. And we've got a lot of pos possibilities to work with them. Thank you so much, Tony. Kate. Yeah, I want to thank Dean Lang for putting together this forum. It was really enlightening to hear from all of the candidates who are running and to see where our priorities overlap and where they converge. Um, seems like we're all working together for the same purpose, which is to serve our community here. And I think differences of opinion are good and civil debate is good. But I don't believe in pretending that we have no values or agendas as individuals or as board members. I don't believe in pretending that D-Link has no power or that no one knows what the solutions are to problems that are facing us like homelessness or public safety. I do believe in weaponizing d Lang's bully pulpit to advocate for solutions that will build a better downtown for everyone. So if you wanna learn more about our Slate's platform, you can check out our website, abetterdtla.com. And we also have an event going on tomorrow night to do a Q&A and help coach people through requesting their ballots. So if you haven't gotten a ballot yet, whether you are supporting us or not, we're still on the fence, we'd love to chat with you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kate. Pablo. First off, thanks to Marcus Loving Good for putting this together and doing a great job moderating. Uh, also I'd like to thank all the candidates for participating and most of all my slate mates for just doing a kick-ass job. These are trying times and they call for leaders at all levels of government that are going to speak up for all of us. Our progressive slate will do ju just that. A better DTLA will do just that. We bring a clear, cohesive and progressive platform to the table that works to bring all people up. We're not afraid to think big and apply those big ideas at a local level. It won't be easy, that's for sure, but we'll work with all of you to make sure city government is more transparent, more accountable, and more accessible. If we, can't do, if we can do that and get more of you involved, we can make real change happen. I'm tired of a D-Link board that tells us the things it can't do. If you don't think you can change, make, thing, make change happen, move it over for those of us who think we can. Vote for us on the progressive slate a better DTLA, and Wind Down Wednesday, tomorrow and the following Wednesday to get involved and just to talk with us. Thank you, Pablo. Kevin. I've dedicated my life to, to public service uh, to help make our community better. If elected, I'm going to use my role on D-Link to continue my public service by working to make our local government better and more transparent and to engage more individuals of all walks of life in our most direct form of government with the goal of creating a better, more inclusive community 
that works for all of us. D-Link has a direct connection to the city council to advocate for our community's needs. Yet for too long, D-Link has failed to utilize their platform to advocate for our community. The incumbents tonight told you that they prioritize friendliness with the city council over advocating for the things the community has repeatedly told D-Link they want. And time and again, D-Link has failed to offer its DL DTLA constituents the transparency and accountability required of them. This is unacceptable to me and it should be unacceptable to all residents and stakeholders of DTLA. So if elected, I'm going to work with the other D-Link representatives to create a government body that is accountable to the public and that serves all of us, not just the wealthy and the well-connected and the developers. Please visit a better DTLA.com and read more about my vision for a more just and equitable DTLA and I hope to earn your vote. Thank you. Thank you so much. Peter. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's been really wonderful to get to speak with everyone tonight and, you know, get a, uh, a, a good handle on what the contrasts are and what the options are here in downtown. Um, you know, thank you everyone who's watching right now. Um, and I just sort of specifically want to say, you know, don't stop voting at this election, right? Come to meetings, put in agenda items, join a committee, um, really keep pushing. Um, because you know nothing stops at the election. Um, it continues to go and go and go after that. Um, and that's really what's gonna make any D-Link board uh, the most successful. Um, and I know we've had a limited time tonight, but um, again, I know some of my other slate mates have mentioned it, but if you have the opportunity to next Wednesday and the Wednesday after, we're gonna be hosting Q and A's so we can really get into some deeper discussions about the issues facing downtown, um, our ideas um, and how we you know, really wanna sort of approach uh, the D-Link board, um, tinyurl.com slash better DTLA um, is the Zoom link. You can get there at seven o'clock tomorrow and the next Wednesday. Um, and just, you know, really looking forward to continuing this conversation uh, throughout our community. Thank you so much, Peter. Melinda. Okay, first of all, thank you, Marcus. I know this is not a fun job, so thank you. Um, and everybody who's watching at home, thank you for caring about local politics. It's not exciting, it's not glamorous, it's not Kim Kardashian and Kanye divorcing, but it's the reality we live in. So thank you for that. Um, a lot of people say that the, defi the definition of insanity is doing something that doesn't work and then still trying to do it over and over again. I've been told by a lot of people that by living in downtown Los Angeles, I am basically de facto insane because of all of the things that I've been through, but I stay because I believe in downtown. I've seen it change a lot over the years from 2007 or eight, make a, do, a good upward bound uh, climb and then plateau for a while. And then in the last year with the pandemic, make a huge crash. But I do believe that uh, we can recover, we can come back and I want to help each other figure out how to make that happen. Thank you. Thank you, Melinda, Patty. Well, uh, what, is, what is a conclusion? There is no conclusion. I have been working in this community for 21 years. Moving here was something I didn't expect to do. And when I got here, I found purpose and I found a daughter. So it was well worth getting here. I would like to help get downtown through this next chapter. I know we've got a lot of rebuild to do, small businesses, need to be brought back. We need to help these people get the services they need. There's so many other dim dimensions to what needs to happen here. Obviously, the unsheltered are a major problem. They need to be helped more than anyone. But we need to look at everyone. And I would be very happy to stay with you for these next two years and help to bring downtown back. Thank you, Patty. Pat. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Marcus. We all know being in the center of attention, what it's like and what you have to do. And thank you to all the panelists because everybody brings a good point of view. I've been in here for 10 years. I've been active in the community, but I was also asked, first of all, to come and be with d -Lank. And I've been there for three years. And I just wanna say that I do have a proven track record and I wanna continue doing that proven track record as well. That's number one is, by working with Marcus, we have some trees in South Park that have been planted. Doggy waste stations, I have them that have been planted. I've spoken up for other people and I've formed communities through um, alliances, through BID, the COPS, and I've been even been asked to be on a safety committee within. I ask for your vote. I wanna continue being feet on the street as well as talking to the people and moving it forward. 
So please give me your vote. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat and Ryan. Thanks everyone. It's been really enlightening to hear from all the panelists. Um, I guess I just wanna start by saying, you know, if you look at the slate that I'm running with, we have a diversity of age, we have a diversity of experiences, careers, backgrounds. It's people who have been invested in this community. It's people who have different perspectives, even on politics, on policy, but everything we do is rooted in practicality. You know, you talk about homelessness. One way is, you know, scream and yell and go light a torch to, you know, LAPD headquarters if you want and all that kind of stuff. What I can tell you is we've helped approve thousands of new apartments. We've helped approve over 2000 new permanent supportive housing units for nonprofits just in downtown. You know, all our individual members actually have experience in downtown. I have family members that were homeless in downtown. Most of the, you know, almost everybody on our slate has as well. We go to Triple H meetings. We go talk to the head of Weingart. We go and put in the work because we're actual locals with real perspective. Focus on solutions. That's what we're about. Thank you so much, Ryan. Well, you all made it. That does it for our forum tonight. Thank you candidates for an insightful forum and for your passion and love for our downtown community. And thank you attendees. I'd like to remind everyone watching that this year's neighborhood council elections are being conducted by the Los Angeles city clerk and by vote by mail. You can get your ballot mailed to you by requesting your ballot by March 16th. Election day is March 23rd, which means you must mail in your ballot or have it postmarked by March 23rd and received by the city clerk no later than March 26th. Our official drop box location will be the Los Angeles Library for those unable to mail their ballots in, as well as a ballot pickup location at the Weingard Center specifically for our unhoused stakeholders. Remember, if you, even if you've registered to vote, you still have to request the ballot online. It will not be automatically sent to you. You can find links to request your ballot and all other election resources by visiting our new and improved D-Link website at www.dlink.com slash elections. Again, I am Marcus Lovingood, and thank you all, all again for a wonderful night, and I will see you all on March 23rd. Good job, Marcus. Thank you. Thank you, Marcus. I'd like to thank Marcus. Ashley for holding up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everyone. Thank you, Good everyone.